Lisa Rice over pre-war intelligence. The committee is also examining White House use of Republican National Committee email accounts. This hearing's two and a half hours. Meeting of the committee will please come to order. I want to begin this morning by sharing some thoughts on subpoenas. I think many of my colleagues know that I take some pride that as chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, sub Health Subcommittee from 79 to 1994, I never issued a single subpoena. That doesn't mean that we didn't conduct investigations. We did including important inquiries into the Bush and Reagan administrations and the tobacco industry. But we were never forced to issue a single subpoena to get the information we needed. That's important to me because I believe subpoenas are one of the most powerful tools of government. They compel others to turn over information, essentially against their will, to the government. It is a, an essential power, but it is one best used as a last resort. I feel especially strong about this because I've seen this committee abuse its subpoena power. From 1997 to 2002, Chairman Dan Burton issued 1,052 subpoenas to the Clinton administration and Democratic targets. None of these subpoenas were debated or voted on in this committee, all were issued unilaterally by the chairman. Some were ridiculously overbroad, others were issued to victims of mistaken identity, and over two million pages of documents were given to the committee in response to these subpoenas. In 1997, Chairman Burton organized the committee on February 12th. By today's date, in 1997, April 25, Chairman Burton had already unilaterally issued 104 subpoenas, including six to the Clinton White House. That's 104 subpoenas in 72 days. If you exclude weekends, that works out to about two subpoenas every day he was chairman. When President Bush took office in 2001, I saw the other extreme. In 2001 and 2002, Chairman Burton didn't issue a single subpoena to the Bush White House. The only subpoenas he issued involved requests for documents involving prior administrations. In, from 2003 to 2006, my friend Tom Davis chaired this committee. He knows the admiration I have for him. I've often said he did more investigating than all the other House Republican chairmen combined. But the fact is that he also did not use the subpoena authority of this committee in the ways I thought would have been, as, uh, would have been appropriate. His approach was the polar opposite of Chairman Burton's during the 1990s. There was too little use of the subpoena under Chairman Davis. In four years, Chairman Davis issued a total of just five subpoenas to the Bush administration. Two were to the Department of Energy on a Yucca Mountain investigation. One was a subpoena Democrats requested relating to the Development Fund for Iraq. One was a subpoena Democrats requested relating to the treatment of a Defense Department whistleblower. He also issued one subpoena Democrats requested relating to Jack Abramoff. And in his capacity as chairman of a separate select committee that examined Hurricane Katrina matters, he issued a subpoena to the Department of Defense. No subpoenas were issued to the Bush White House. Think about that contrast. 1,052 subpoenas to the Clinton administration and Democratic targets compared to just five subpoenas to the Bush administration. Well, this committee has lived at two extremes, and neither has served the public well. As chair, I don't want to be at either extreme. I want this committee to be independent, as nonpartisan as possible, and fact-driven. My goal is to conduct investigations without subpoenas. But if we are stonewalled and we can't hesitate, then 
uh, to uh, call out the powers that are available to us. We originally had four matters scheduled for today, but we'll, uh, we'll, we will only consider two at this meeting. Yesterday, the White House substantially complied with our request relating to MZM, so there is no need to consider that issue today. Also yesterday, Fred Fielding, the White House counsel, made a constructive suggestion in a letter relating to the committee's interest in questioning former White House Chief of Staff Andrew Card. He suggested that the committee interview the head of the White House Office of Administration before we consider whether we need Mr. Card's testimony. I have some concerns about how such an interview would be conducted. For example, it would need to be an on-the-record interview that is trans transcribed by a court reporter, but because Mr. Fielding's offer provides an opening to resolve this matter without a subpoena, I will postpone consideration of the card subpoena until tomorrow so that we can have a chance to talk further with Mr. Fielding. That leaves two issues for today. Since the committee's hearing with GSA Administrator Laurita Doan on March 28th, we've been trying to reach an agreement on the RNC uh, to get relevant materials. The committee's interest is simple. Some White House employees were using RNC computers for their official communications. We, were, we are interested in a limited set of documents from, from the RNC. We're asking for materials relating to the PowerPoint presentation White House official Scott Jennings made to the General Services Administration and other federal agencies, and we're asking for materials that might have subverted the Presidential Records Act. We have tried to be as targeted as possible, and I had hoped we could work this out cooperatively. That does not seem possible. This morning, the RNC sent a last-minute letter before our committee but provided no additional information beyond a partial list of some of the White House officials who held RNC email accounts. We still don't have the full list of the 50 to 60 White House officials who held these accounts. And instead of being told how many emails the officials sent and received, the RNC has informed us that it has gathered approximately 25,500,000 kilobytes of email data. While I appreciate knowing the number of kilobytes of data the RNC has, that obviously isn't responsive to our requests. So we will consider a motion on this matter this morning. The second issue just plainly misses me. For four years, I have been trying to get information from Secretary Condoleezza Rice on a variety of issues, including the reference to uranium and Niger in the President's 2003 State of the Union speech. In the last seven weeks, I have sent four letters to Secretary Rice and received three responses from her staff. My request is simple. I would like Secretary Rice to suggest a date that would be convenient for her to testify before our committee. Secretary Rice has already te testified before House and Senate committees seven times this year. There is nothing extraordinary about our committee's request, but we have hit a brick wall with the Secretary of State. She will not propose a date to testify, she will not agree to testify, and she insists that our committee be satisfied with partial information that was previously, previously submitted to other committees. The White House is not known for welcoming oversight, but at least the White House is providing the committee with the MZM documents the committee has sought and has made an overture to advance the committee's inquiry into the White House Security Office. Secretary Rice has taken none of these steps. I regret, I deeply regret, that the Secretary of State is giving us no choice but to proceed with the subpoena. I understand that some members on the Republican side may not agree with the motions I'm making today. That, of course, is their right. But I urge all members to recognize the new approach I'm trying to bring to this committee. Under the rules of this committee, the chairman has the power to issue subpoenas without debate or votes in the committee. That's what Dan Burton used to do. 
In fact, that's what he did over a thousand times. But I'm taking a different approach today. I believe the entire committee should have a chance to participate in the subpoenas we will consider today. That uh, completes my opening statement on what we're doing today. We will have separate discussion of each subpoena. What I'd like to suggest, if it's acceptable to the members, that uh, Mr. Davis give an opening, general opening statement as well. And then uh, we go to the individual subpoenas, and then all members will have a chance to make opening statements on each of the individual subpoenas. I'd okay. like to ask unanimous consent to agree to that uh, proposal, which we've worked out with Mr. Davis. Uh, without objection, that will be the order, and the ranking member is recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know I have great respect for you, high regard for the good work you've done, uh, we've done together over the years. So I'm disappointed uh, we're here today to talk about subpoenas that are ill-advised, unnecessary, or premature. For the most part, I agree that the committee has the right to get the information that you're seeking. But with that right comes the obligation to obtain what we need in the most efficient, least obtrusive way possible. And I think what we're doing today is not the right way. As chairman, I made it a point to consult with the minority and keep you fully informed. Whether the subject was Sandy Berger, Jack Abramoff, we tried to stick to the substantive issues and follow a deliberate, fair process in getting to the facts. We didn't pull any punches in asking the tough questions, issuing subpoenas, or making the hard-hitting findings in the Hurricane Katrina investigation. The administration wasn't always happy about it. Sometimes Democrats didn't like what we did. But we kept the strike zone steady and tried to call them as we saw them. I don't think you dispute that. Now that we're in the minority, I've agreed with many of your document requests uh, over the past few weeks and, and subpoenas. Earlier this week, I concurred in subpoenas for two witnesses in the Tillman investigation. But the subpoenas before us today strike me as overreaching, substituting quantity for quality by bundling a number of old issues and grievances in an effort to get high-profile administration figures under oath before the cameras for the sake of political theatrics and I can't support that. The proposed subpoena to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice is, for where I'm sitting, way outside of the strike zone, way over the line. As good as we are, we're not the only competent or cognizant tribunal around. Given the number of House and Senate committees with far more direct jurisdictional claims on her time than ours, this precedent would make testifying up here her full-time job to the detriment of our national security and stature. And the questions allegedly driving this effort to compel the nation's top diplomat to spend days of her valuable time preparing and testifying have either been asked and answered in other forms or can be answered just as completely by someone else. On the matter of Iraq and uranium from Niger, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the Rob Silberman Commission, and the British House of Commons inquiry all concluded the statements in the President's State of the Union address reflected the broadly supported state of knowledge at the time. Secretary Rice answered most of the key questions in this subpoena during her Senate confirmation testimony. And as we have right over here, we have asked and answered the questions this committee would like to ask that she answered under oath before the Senate committee. The Department of State has been over backwards providing responses and documents to the Chairman's numerous requests, some of which were made uh, when he was still the ranking member. I might add the reports that have come from three independent tribunals, including the Senate Intelligence Committee, the Rob Silberman Report, and the House of Commons. These, this, these are the reports, three previous reports on this issue. And to quote one of my favorite Democrats, Henry, you, back then you talked about uh, earlier on, you talked about uh, uh, oversight. We talked about it makes no sense. This is in uh, uh, March 6, 1997. You said it makes no sense to direct multiple congressional committees to investigate the same abuses. Multiple investigations are duplicative and wasteful. You were right then. I think you're wrong now. So what's left to investigate? We all know and acknowledge the statements in the State of the Union speech were later proved to be wrong. Let's stipulate that. Everyone else has. But there's no evidence, and many have looked at that, as we noted here, that the information was purposely manipulated. And we're questioning the competence and the credibility of the Democratic senators who signed the Intelligence Committee report, of former Democratic Senator Chuck Robb, and of the House of Commons independent investigation. Beyond the duplicative, um, uh, the, uh, the, the duplicative, this subpoena reaches for the absurd. 
In a transparent attempt to give this witch hunt against Secretary Rice some heft, the majority also asks why the State Department doesn't support needle exchange programs. Duh, like they're against U.S. law, that's why. And why the State Department doesn't appoint representatives who oppose administration policies to official international delegations. And why Ambassador Richard Jones was appointed a special envoy to Iraq while the subject of a criminal investigation. These questions fall somewhere between unworthy and abusive. No administration would implement programs abroad prohibited by law or appoint known opponents to undermine its own policy objectives at sensitive multilateral meetings. And as the majority has been informed, uh, Ambassador Jones was not the subject of any criminal probe. Secretary Rice also has a busy schedule. We have to ask ourselves, is she better off coming up here, preparing for testimony, spending a day up here before the cameras, or doing the duties that she is already set to do over the next few weeks? travel to Oslo, Norway for a meeting of NATO foreign ministers where she'll discuss with her counterparts NATO's missions in Afghanistan and Kosovo and a range of other issues, traveling to Egypt for the launch of the Iraq Neighbors Conference. This is exactly the Middle East diplomacy my friends on the Democratic side have urged, traveling to Russia for bilateral discussions on Iran and, and Kosovo, travel to the Middle East to continue with negotiations on the Middle East peace process, travel to Asia to discuss, among other things, the six-party response to North Korea hosting the Foreign Minister of Australia, a leader of one of our closest allies, for a substantial meeting to further ties. And in between, the Secretary will have numerous other meetings with other important heads of state and foreign ministers. Each of these is far more important than answering years-old questions that have been asked and answered. It seems the majority, um, uh, well, let me also say, on the subject of the subpoenas to the RNC, I'm reluctant to but I would like to find a way for us to agree on a reasonable scope and time frame. I think we have rights to get this information, Mr. Chairman, as we have discussed before. Um, it seems, though, in this case, the majority has other sources of information on White House security and classification policies that you have not shared with us. So a subpoena to the former White House Chief of Staff, I think, is premature and we've had, until we have had that discussion. We support you uh, on the MZM, but th that information has come uh, forward. My disappointment is how we got here is deepened by my fear of what it means going forward. The chairman and the majority seem to have forgotten the lessons about moderation and bipartisanship they have tried to teach us over the past 12 years. When his chair was here, my friend Mr. Waxman denounced duplicative probes, overuse of the subpoena power and corrosive partisanship and oversight inquiries. As important as it is for the White House to cooperate with us, you said in 1997, we have to be reasonable in our request and careful in the acquisitions we make. That same year, in a uh, New York Times piece, you noted that we must break the vicious cycle of Watergate wannabe investigations that are more concerned with scoring political points than with reform. Nasty partisan hearings would only fulfill the public's lowest expectations and deepen its cynicism. I didn't disagree then, and we should all take those words to heart now. Bipartisanship and collegiality shouldn't be expedients we use to make up for lack of power. They should be enduring principles we use to guide our work no matter where we sit. Mr. Chairman, I admire your zeal, but if I might offer some unsolicited uh, counsel, let me suggest you slow down, take a longer view. How we do our job is as important as what we do here. Or, as was observed long ago, zeal without knowledge is like fire without a grate to contain it, like a sword without a hilt to wield it by, like a high-bred horse without a bridle to guide him. It speaks without thinking, acts without planning, seeks to accomplish a good end without adoption of becoming means. We have the means to do this right, to get the information the Committee needs without rancor, without partisanship, and without distracting indispensable administration officials from their critical duties. As always, I want to work with the Chairman and the majority to do constructive oversight and reform government for the benefit of the American people. I just think this uh, subpoena of Secretary Rice for questions that have been asked and answered and fully investigated prior to this to take her away uh, from other important tasks. I don't think a Secretary of State, to my knowledge, has ever appeared before this committee before. There are other committees that uh, she appears of. Uh, you ask a wide-ranging uh, probe. I just don't think this is the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. We have three separate um, subpoenas that the committee will be um, asked to vote on. Uh, we'll take them up <laughs> one at a time. We'll allow members to make opening statements if they desire to on each of the um, proposed subpoenas. And uh, we will roll the votes on all the subpoenas as we have worked out with um, Mr. Davis. The first uh, um, motion is that the committee 
direct the chairman to execute and issue a subpoena to the Republican National Committee for a documents containing information about the use of RNC email accounts held by the held by White House officials, including documents identifying one, the White House officials with RNC email accounts, two, the number of emails these White House officials sent and received using these accounts, and three, the number of emails these White House officials sent to or received from Federal officials, and B, the testimony of RNC Chairman Mike Duncan on May 8, 2007, about the U.S. of our RNC uh, accounts, email accounts held by White House officials. That is the matter before us. And I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to make an opening statement, and then I'll recognize members for opening statements of their own. Mr. Chairman, my, mine is not really an opening statement. It's a parliamentary objection. Yes, certainly. What does the gentleman wish to um, ask? Would you rather have me I have a statement to read, but I don't believe we should go ahead with this motion. I'm sorry, what? Uh, I'm objecting to go ahead, ahead with the subpoena. And would, would you like me to do that as an opening statement? or? Well, why don't we do that as an opening statement? Because uh, uh, we're going to put this to a vote, and I know that some members support it and others will oppose it. M Mr. 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 Uh, Chairman, Mr. let me ask the Chairman to go ahead and then recognize Mr. Souter first with us. I think that will take care of it. Okay, that's fine. Over the past year, three separate congressional investigations have found that White House officials rely on RNC email accounts to conduct official White House business and to communicate with agencies, agency officials. One of the investigation, uh, investigations and examination of the General Services Administration found that a White House official had used his RNC account to plan for a political briefing that was held at GSA headquarters and broadcast through a video feed to GSA offices nationwide. This briefing was a political and strategic event that had no connection to GSA's mission. It should not have taken place in a federal building. Another investigation and examination into White House contacts with lobbyist Jack Abramoff found that White House officials were using RNC email accounts to communicate with Abramoff's, uh, Ab with Abramoff lobbyists with about official government business. Some of the emails suggested using the RNC accounts to avoid leaving a record of the communications. And the third investigation involved the firing of the U.S. attorneys. The, US, uh, the use of RNC emails to conduct official White House business is a serious abuse. The RNC document preservation policy is to destroy emails after 30 days. As a result, years of emails from top White House officials like Karl Rove were deleted. Even today, it is unclear how many of these emails can be recovered. The failure to preserve these emails is a violation of the Presidential Records Act. As a committee with jurisdiction over this act, we have sought basic information from the RNC about the magnitude of the problem. Over the past month, the committee has sent four letters to the RNC requesting information about the use of RNC email accounts by White House officials. We have asked repeatedly for the most basic information, such as the names of the officials who have RNC email accounts, how many emails they sent and received, and how many emails were sent to federal agencies through RNC accounts. But the RNC has not been responsive. We have been slow walked and stonewalled and that is not acceptable. The RNC sent a letter this morning that provides no additional information except a list of 37 White House officials who used RNC email accounts. And even this information appears incomplete. As the RNC had informed us, there were appro approximately 50 White House account holders. The RNC's letter also states that the total kilobytes of emails for these users the significance of which is unclear. And this information does not answer basic question of how many emails were sent by each White House account user. As a result, I'm asking the committee to approve this subpoena. It asks the RNC to provide answers to basic questions about the use of RNC email accounts by White House officials, such as a list of which officials uses um, these accounts and how many emails they sent and received. The deadline is two weeks. It also asked the head of the RNC, Mike Duncan,
to appear before the committee in two weeks to testify about these matters. Depending on the kind of response the committee receives from the RNC in the interim, I will consult with the members about whether the committee will need to proceed with this hearing. This is a narrow subpoena that seeks the most basic information from the RNC, and I ask for its approval. I'd like to now uh, call Mr. on. Mr. Chairman, can I just interrupt? We have not yes. seen a copy of the subpoena. That would be helpful if we could uh, see the copy uh, of the proposed subpoena so we know what we're talking about. It's been said it's narrowly tarot. I'm informed by our staff director that uh, we provided the minority a draft of the subpoena. But the motion before us is not to vote on the text of the subpoena, but to instruct uh, the issuance of the subpoena. My only question was, you said it was narrowly tailored, uh, and, and this is important, that mm -hmm. it was narrowly tailored. And so the draft is important because uh, a subpoena could be very broadly to look at any RNC record or it could be very narrow. And that's, I think uh, that's what we would want to look at before I comment. Well, that's why we shared the draft last night, but uh, we will uh -huh. give it to you again. Uh -huh. Parliamentary inquiry. It's in the packets that I think members have before them. All right. Parliamentary inquiry. Who, who's seeking the parliamentary? Mr. 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 Chairman, uh, I, I, Mr. I Sowder, have. I have. Be recognized? Uh, uh, my comments. Gentleman's were, recognized for five minutes. Thank you. My my comments weren't on the merits of this resolution, but on the very thing we're we're arguing here, and whether this is a legitimate process to go forward, given the way. Uh, the majority has run roughshod over committee rules, and I understand that you can outvote us, but I'm asking you out of, out of fairness to withdraw these subpoenas at this time because the notice provided the minority failed to comply with the committee's rules or even basic concepts of fairness. Withholding the actual text of motions until 1045 last night, by the way, just giving us a draft of, of language to boot, the misleading presentation of subpoena language, and the expansion of the motion beyond the matters presented to the majority's memorandum demonstrate that the basic notice requirements for matters coming before this committee were not met. I'm deeply concerned with the process the majority has used to bring these motions before the committee. The required memorandum represented that we would be considering motions, but did not provide the text of any of those till 1045 last night. And even that was after being provided the actual text of subpoenas at 730. So while the majority misled us into trying to address the text of subpoenas, they were busily concocting their alternative strategy, of which we were informed more than three hours later. It is ironic, to say the least, indeed, that one of the majority's final motions is directed at allegedly fabricated intelligence when we in good faith accepted what we now know were fabricated subpoenas. Our rules require that the majority provide a memorandum at least three calendar days before each meeting or hearing explaining the purpose of the meeting or hearing. While the memorandum provided to the members talked about motions, it did not provide specific language of the motions. Then instead of motions, the majority gave us subpoenas and now has switched back to motions. I hardly think the committee rules were intended to allow the majority to conceal in this way from the minority the true matters to be brought before the committee. It flies in the face of basic procedural fairness. In addition to our concerns about the misleading procedure used by the majority, I'm also deeply troubled that simply the lateness of the motions hardly left any time for us or our staff to consider their merits. I'm glad the majority withdrew the specific language from one of their subpoenas to the RNC. Not only was its description of the documents confusing, but it called for records relating to all me emails to an RNC account, uh, email account from a government account, and from an RNC email account to a government account. From this proposal, we can now see what the majority is truly seeking. This has nothing to do with compliance with the Presidential Records Act. Any email to or from a government account is properly reserved. The only records relevant to compliance with PRA are those emails that were sent internally on the RNC system that should have been sent from or to a government system. I hope the withdrawal of the specific subpoena language reflects the majority's recognition that the original language was overly broad. Finally, in the case of subpoenas for individuals to appear to testify, since we do not know the time or date of testimony or whether the persons testifying should also produce documents, we had little time to consider whether subpoenas in all respects were appropriate. Moreover, one motion has added the demand for RNC Chairman Mike Duncan to appear to testify. This was definitely not described or suggested in any way in the majority's memo and clearly cannot be brought before the committee today under committee rules. As of 9.15 this morning, the, the chairman could not decide whether to proceed with a motion on Andy Card. What kind of notice is that? 
This is not the way that chairman, uh, former Chairman Tom Davis ran the committee, and you shouldn't do it either. I repeat my request and respectively ask that you withdraw all subpoenas from consideration today so minority has basic rights to consider how to respond. Yield back. Well, if the chair might respond to the gentleman, uh, we have been very careful to comply with the rules. We have given three days' notice for this meeting and uh, informed all members what the subject matter was of the, uh, of the meeting today, what would be before us. Uh, I also would point out that this is, um, this is something that was not extended even to us when we were in the minority to have a chance to vote on it. I'm going to give all members a chance to speak on it and to vote on it. Uh, we have complied with the rules and the uh, matter Mr. is appropriately before us. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a motion to amend your motion and I would like to present it at the appropriate time. Uh, I can either use my five minutes or whatever the chair would uh, uh, would deem appropriate, but I do have a motion to amend the pending motion that you have just uh, mm -hmm. decided to go forward with. Well, I, 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 however you all want to proceed, um, I've Pro called for inquiry. open. One minute, Chairman, speaking in answer to a second. previous parliamentary inquiry. We've called for uh, opening statements on the motion to before us, which is to instruct for this particular subpoena. Uh, I will recognize members if they want to make opening statements. If members want to proceed to the text of the motion itself and then offer amendments, we can do that. Let me just inquire, does anyone wish to make an opening statement? Uh, parliamentary inquiry. Yes, state your parliamentary inquiry. Uh, operationally, under the committee rules and based on the unanimous consent agreement, the chair said that we'll have opening statements on each motion. Then, after the opening statements, operationally under, under our committee rules, it then functions as a markup where anyone can strike the last word and be recognized for five minutes and offer an amendment at that point. Uh, is that not the case? That's correct. Thank you. Let me inquire if anyone wishes to make an opening uh, statement on this particular. I have a further uh, parliamentary inquiry in response to the chairman because certainly. Mr. Micah came. Gentleman's recognized. I, I want to clarify the, the chairman's position is, is that as long as you notify us three days ahead what the general subject is, uh, you can provide, you, you don't have to provide the specifics. Of, of what you're dealing with, uh, whether it's a motion or a subpoena, or it can go back and forth either the night of or the morning of. For example, could you have gone forward with uh, Andrew Card this morning uh, without informing us? The, the chair's position is that there's a requirement for three days' notice to, in, to indicate what matters will be before the committee. It's not uncommon to have a, a, a bill noticed without the text of the bill being submitted to the members uh, in advance. But would you? Uh, are you asserting that the chair has a right, for example, to add Mike Duncan without notifying us? Um, the rule two on meetings says um, every member of the committee or the appropriate subcommittee, unless prevented by unusual circumstances, shall be provided with a memorandum at least three day calendar days before each meeting or hearing explaining, one, the purpose of the meeting or hearing, and two, the names, titles, background, and reasons for appearance of any witness. The ranking minority member shall be responsible for providing the same information on witnesses whom the minority may request. The chair believes he's complied Chairman, with the uh, rules. Just a, a quick uh, further clarification, if I may, and I am trying to speed the process up. Mr. Chairman, um, if uh, I, th I believe I have the only motion on our side to amend on your particular motion, and if Mr. Davis would let me go first, I could offer that motion within my five minutes uh, rather than at the end. Then if people wanted to comment uh, on it rather than duplicating the debate, so to speak, I could offer that motion. And I, I may ask for a recorded vote in compliance with the agreement that we have to have those votes all ganged, I guess, or delayed to the end. I am truly trying to speed up the process with this suggestion. I, I appreciate the, 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 the gentleman's request, and let me put it to the members of the committee. Uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent that m members, that the proposal before us be open for amendment at any point. 
Members will still have the right to strike the last word if they wish to um, engage in a debate and use five minutes of time uh, to do that. And if we proceed in that way, we can go immediately um, to amendments. Is there any objection to that request? If not, uh, that will be the order. And the gentleman from Florida uh, wishes to offer, to be recognized to offer an amendment okay. to the well, proposal you. that's thank before Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I truly did. Uh, is the uh, amendment at the desk? Uh, could we distribute the amendment? It is at the desk. Um, well, the desk doesn't think so. There he is. Sorry. <laughs> okay. okay. There, and could we distribute the amendment? Yeah, let's, have the, let's have the uh, amendment read. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I Townsend. reserve a point of order. A point of order is reserved on the, on the amendment. Thank you. If I may proceed, I No, can... not until the clerk uh, presents the oh, amendment okay. to us. Amendment to motion, Ray Berger and Presidential Record Act, uh, Mr. Micah. I move that the committee direct the chairman to amend the motion to include a subpoena to Samuel R. Berger seeking testimony related to how the previous administration handled its responsibilities under the Presidential Record Act. The committee shall also obtain testimony from Mr. Berger regarding his role as the designee to the 9-11 Commission for former President Clinton. As has been, as has been well chronicled by this committee, on three separate visits to the National Archive, Mr. Berger removed and destroyed highly classified documents. Among other criminal violations, Mr. Berger's action led to the destruction of records retained pursuant to the Presidential Record Act. The amendment is before us. Gentleman from New York. You know, you know um, my good friend from Florida, who I have great admiration and respect for, I must say, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is actually expanding the scope. And it's a different situation, so I don't see how uh, we could even include it at this time because it's just not germane. As much as I'd like to be supportive of my friend, you know, from uh, the state of Florida, uh, uh, this is this is not germane, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I'm trying to look at the widest possible stretch, but I still can't get there. This is all together a different topic. Uh, gentleman hey. insists on his point of order. Hey, may I, uh, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. respond. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I did offer this uh, motion because I think that, uh, well, first of all, if I recall, Mr. Chairman, back to uh, some of the questions that were raised during the, uh, the GSA hearing, uh, and we did learn of, um, of some of the activities uh, 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 that uh, were conducted at that time, and I think I agreed with you that we should look further. So I have no problem with looking at uh, uh, deleted emails or looking at uh, in uh, information, and even going so far as uh, dealing with some of the presidential uh, records. But I think in all fairness, if we're going to talk about deletion of records and uh, Presidential Records Act, uh, we, we do need to look at the, the Sandy Berger uh, issue where he deleted, uh, in fact, uh, uh, had, had been convicted of um, stealing, mishandling, and destroying highly classified documents from the National Archives. So I think that in the past administration, we have an, ex an egregious example of uh, deletion and similar mishandling uh, that we should look into. Now, this isn't something I'm just raising today and just for you, Mr. Chairman, or since you've uh, assumed the majority. Uh, I'd like to submit for the record a letter October 11th, and it's signed by many leading members of this com committee who asked, for, I, uh, and I helped uh, lead this event, or this, uh, this particular request, to the, uh, the Committee on Government Reform to ask that we look into the deletion of uh, records uh, by Sandy Berger. This is dated October 11th, so I'd submit this as part of my request uh, to amend your, your motion. Uh, furthermore, uh, we have With, a law. Without objection, the uh, okay. additional information Further you wish to append to the uh, statement will be um, added to the okay. record. Furthermore, I don't think it's fair uh, to look at, uh, again, one administration other than, uh, rather than another, because we know from what, from what we've uh, heard that Mr. Berger seems to have been afforded some special treatment. We've also found, and the uh, 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 our committee staff has found, uh, both majority and minority have found, that Mr. Berger uh, left stolen, highly classified documents 
at a construction site and went to extraordinary measures to, see, to uh, sneak them out of the ar ar archives. In fact, um, we're talking about documents uh, here that deal with national security as opposed to political uh, activity in the, in the White House. So I think that the, the cause for us to, to be fair and look at how uh, public documents and presidential records are handled, particularly these that, that uh, are at the very highest level of our national security. Now, furthermore, uh, a review of the documents did, uh, did not conform to the usual requirements for re reviewing classified documents in a secure facility under strict supervision. This is quite different than, uh, again, what we had uh, with, the, with what's in the, in the request, but I think it goes to the heart of a, an even more fundamental matter about destroying documents, about deleting information that we should have access to. And unfortunately, had the Justice Department properly notified the 9-11 Commission, and we're not talking about uh, a political contest in 2008, we're talking about the designated individual by President Clinton and the Clinton, Clinton administration to provide information to the 9-11 Commission. Uh, uh, basically, what we've, we've seen is deletion of information that tries to cleanse history, involvement, and, and uh, deals also with, again, the most highly classified national security issues. So I think in, a, uh, in, in a fairness, I think we should exp expand this uh, motion, ask Mr. B uh, Berger to come in. Uh, we, we, di we did not know, in fact, at the time uh, that, uh, uh, I think we were told, and, and the Department of Justice was told that uh, there were only copies we f now find out that he stuffed uh, into various uh, clothing, I don't know if it was socks or where, we, and that's something we should find out, highly classified original documents, and then uh, they were destroyed. And the only way we uh, can really know what took place, again, dealing with presidential records, uh, so I think we, ha we clearly uh, are, are dealing here with uh, similar uh, uh, re requests. Uh, dealing with highly classified documents as opposed to political documents, maybe maybe you don't want to uh, differentiate uh, on that basis. But I think that uh, I'm well within uh, within uh, the parameters of what could be requested to expand your your motion, and I think that would be fair. <laughs> and I'll also request a vote on this at the appropriate time. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Davis, let me say that the matter that's before us right now is. Uh, the point of order. The uh, gentleman went on about the merits, and I thought that was appropriate to allow him to discuss the merits of it, but the debate has to be, we have to resolve the point of order first. Let me address the point of order, because we're really, uh, this is kind of new ground for this committee. Uh, in, in theory, we don't have to have a markup at all on a subpoena. The chairman has the authority on his own uh, to issue a subpoena. Uh, our, our rules say that he consults with, with me, uh, but he has the authority on his pen. So bringing this before the committee, I think, raises a precedent in terms of how the committee operates once you bring it before us, what are the different rights. In the notice for the hearing, uh, the notice, uh, the, the, the larger heading talks about um, relating to RNC emails, but it also talks about violations of the Presidential Records Act uh, and the Hatch Act by White House officials. And clearly the Presidential Records Act, um, it, if you take a look at it and the archives, the report from the IG of the archives, uh, the criminal charge Mr. Berger pled guilty and the unanswered questions that have been raised as a report from the minority of this committee that we've reported out uh, raises a host of issues that I hope the committee would address and I would hope that you'd uh, find it reasonable to find it in order. But uh, this is probably a case of first impression for the committee in terms of how we would handle a markup mm -hmm. of a subpoena. But I want to just add that historic context. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Further uh, discussion on the point of order itself. Yes. On, the, on the point of order, on my recognized. understanding of our, our earlier exchange when asked the question about Mr. Duncan being added and it uh, relating to the Government Records Act, you said uh, you could, in fact, do that this morning. When I asked about Mr. Card being added, you, in fact, said the committee could do it today. So it seems like, <clears throat> given that the underlying subject matter, Presidential Records Act, uh, national security matters, uh, how decisions are made is directly relevant and would be inconsistent to move ahead with other subpoenas that were added at the last minute without minority notice and yet block one that the minority requests. Thank you. Any, anyone else wishes to be Mr. heard on Mr. the Chairman. point of order itself? On the point of order. Gentleman from North Carolina. 
Uh, I thank the chairman uh, for the opportunity to speak on whether or not our amendment is germane to the motion. Um, I would tell you that because there are two separate uh, issues within this subpoena, uh, it, that it's not simply related to emails, uh, but you're seeking testimony related to the uh, Presidential Records Act, that the amendment offered today by Mr. Micah is in fact germane because it pertains to the larger question of the Presidential Records Act. If the chair rules that this is not germane, the chair is then ruling that it is not under the Presidential Records Act, that in fact it is only seeking RNC emails. Thus, the chair is just playing a political game trying to get Republican emails now that the Democrats have the majority. Uh, furthermore, uh, furthermore uh, I would also uh, tell the chair that um, as, a, a, as a member of the minority, I would ask, uh, I would appeal the ruling of the chair if he in fact rules that this is not germane uh, because I believe that it is in keeping with House rules uh, and the rules of the committee. Uh, the, the motion that Mr. Micah made is in fact germane to the larger issue of the Presidential Records Act. If I do call for an appealing of the ruling of the chair under the House rules and under the rules of this committee, uh, we will then have to proceed to an immediate vote. Uh, so I think that I would uh, certainly appreciate if the chair considered the, those matters. Anyone else wish to be heard on the point of order? Uh, then the chair is prepared to rule. The uh, scope of the proposal before us is a motion to issue a subpoena to the RNC for testimony and documents. The um, scope of the matter before us relates to the RNC. The amendment that's been proposed relates to Sandy Berger. It is not within the scope of the proposal that's before us. Uh, I understand that there may be an appeal of the decision of the chair. The chair is ruling as he thinks is the appropriate one and the right one under the rules. And uh, I would also point out to the gentleman who suggested he's going to appeal my decision that he might regard, take a look at the 600,000 pages of DNC emails and documents that were obtained by this committee without a chance for anybody to vote on them. Uh, I want to give members a chance to vote on this specific subpoena. And in considering this specific subpoena, the only uh, matter that would be germane would be matters related to the Republican National Committee. So the uh, point of order from the gentleman uh, from New York Mr. is uh, well taken. Mr. Chairman, uh, I will uh, appeal the decision of the chair and ask again that we defer that vote. Uh, uh, we won't get a vote probably on my motion, but we can get a vote on that as uh, you take up uh, your uh, votes on the okay. subpoena request, if that's appropriate. The, then the motion before us is to appeal the decision of the chair, and that vote will be taken at the uh, conclusion Mr. Chairman, of the uh, Mr. discussions Chairman. of other amendments. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, point uh, Mr. of order. Mr. Issa. Point of order. I have an amendment at the desk, but obviously I'll yield Mr. to the point Mr. of order. Mr. Chairman, a point of order. A point of order. Uh, under House rules, <laughs> a, a question of germaneness uh, to the amendment is lodged against uh, was lodged by the majority against Mr. Micah's proposal. Uh, it is the first operational motion. It must be dispensed with before we can proceed with any other business under House rules uh, and, and the unanimous consent agreement uh, that the chair announced uh, is not operational, so we would have to move into an immediate vote under House rules and the rules of the committee. Well, I thought we had uh, unanimous I consent because the gentleman who asked the appeal of the decision of the chair asked to appeal the decision of the chair and to hold the vote. Uh, and I uh, su suggested that was what we would do. So uh, uh, whatever the members wish, do you want to take the vote now? Well, uh, if I Mr. would chair. ask the gentleman to withdraw his objection, I think we had a gentleman's agreement to try to proceed in fashion, if you would, Mr. McHenry, I, I'll, I'll go along with having the vote when everyone uh, is here. Well, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, under I, I'm just stating the rules. If, if the chair says that my interpretation of the rules is, in fact, not the case, the chair is entitled to do that. Well, gentlemen, you, it, it's my understanding that we had a unanimous consent. I mean, if that was my understanding. 
Well, I'm also not sure that you're correct in your statement of the rules, but we'll, we'll proceed however the uh, members of the committee wish to proceed. He should not appeal that rule. That new rule in his own interest. So you asked? My, uh, my decision was made on the merits. I think it was a fair one. If members want to appeal it, uh, then that's your right to do so. I look at it as a political action to do that when it's a fair ruling. But the members have a right to seek a, uh, uh, an appeal of the decision of the chair. And we will have a vote on the decision of the chair. And we will uh, have that vote when we take the other votes uh, on uh, the proposals before us today. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Could we ask one other parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman? Yes, one just one second. Uh, let, let me, before I recognize Mr. Davis, my uh, uh, staff director has indicated, Mr. McHenry, I want you to be particularly aware of this, that we just consulted with the parliamentarian of the House and we shared with him the, the MICA proposal. He agreed that it was not germane. Uh, I think my ruling is a fair one, and uh, if the members still want to appeal the decision, they're, they're welcome to do so. But if we do make a fair ruling consistent with the parliamentarian's uh, uh, opinion, uh, I think it ought to stand. Mr. Davis? Mr. Chairman, let me just understand, though, but you are ruling under the same hearing that although the burger is out, that Mike Duncan, who is not RNC but is a acting up, whatever he is, would be eligible for subpoena. Is that correct? Uh, yes. I think he is the head of the Republican National Committee. He's their chief staffer, I think, but he's not. Uh, but, testimony but of RNC chairman is the way we okay. phrased it. He's not chairman. Lincoln under. Martinez is chairman. Okay. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, clerk will report and read the amendment by a gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Amendment to the motion raised DNC for, dem for documents by Mr. Issa. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. We have a point of order. I think we ought to have the reading of the amendment because it hasn't been shared with us. Chairman, the gentleman from New York a reserves a point of order on the amendment. Please read the amendment. I move the committee direct the chairman to amend the motion to include a subpoena to the Democratic National Committee seeking all documents relating to policies and procedures for use and retention of DNC maintained email. All documents relating to policies and procedures for ensuring that official government business conducted on DNC maintained email accounts are preserved to comply with all applicable records retention laws, including but not limited to the Presidential Record Act of 1978. All email documents sent or received by White House officials on a DNC maintained email account relating to the use of federal agencies or resources to help Democratic candidates. All email documents sent or received by White House officials on a DNC, on a DNC maintained email account relating to official government business. The uh, proposal has been read. The gentleman from New York, do you insist on your point of order? I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, state your point of order. Mr. Chairman, um, um, this is not germane. I mean, uh, uh, here again, you know, uh, and I really want to say to you that um, I, re I really appreciate, you know, your fairness here, Mr. Chairman and that you are involving us, you know, uh, in this process in terms of, uh, uh, but the point is that knowing that uh, you did not have to do that, and I respect that, but the point is that, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, this is not germane, and, uh, and I think that uh, uh, um, the gentleman uh, from California probably knows it's not germane, but uh, uh, he wants to make a political point, and of course, um, that's what I think he's trying to do. And it's unfortunate, because I think we have some serious matters here that we need to try to get on with, and that I'm hoping that he will understand it and will probably withdraw it and let us move forward. A point of order has been uh, argued. Uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, is recognized. To Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of order. Uh, this amendment is in order. It's in order because uh, with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, contrary to your statement that it's all about the RNC, uh, it's not all about the RNC. It's about the Presidential Records Act of 1978. And in fact, the Presidential Records Act, which is the compelling question here, it is not a question of whether the RNC did something. It's a question of whether the Office of the President did something 
uh, in transferring records during a period of time. The reason for making this balance, first of all, is a matter of fairness. If we're going to evaluate the activities of the office of this president, uh, which I think is always appropriate and appropriate within this committee, that in fact we should balance the request, compare similar documents over similar periods of time, and, and sift out, quite candidly, those which in looking at the actions of two now nearly eight-year presidencies and their activities, we may choose to see as more venal if they occur versus the ones that in fact crossed the 1978 line. So I would argue, and I believe successfully, and I believe with the support of the parliamentarian, since you used them in the last time, I strongly suggest you use them this time, that in fact your subpoena is under the 1978 Presidential Records Act. The 1978 Pre uh, Presidential Records Act clearly would have authority over one president, the same as the other, all the way back to 1978, and that expanding the question of whether or not transfers were made, correspondence occurred, whether in writing or through electronic media, is equally important, regardless of a particular time or date, uh, or a date in time, if you will, that may have occurred. So that's the reason that, that I'm expanding this. I'm not expanding it on a partisan basis, just the opposite. With all uh, suggestions uh, to help you do your job and us do our job better, it would be very clear that if we're asking the same questions of the two entities, we're causing the two entities to spend the same amount of money to answer and produce those records. Uh, by the way, I'll mention with hard money, uh, under the, the uh, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, that in fact we would be creating the same burden holding each of the two presidents, each of the two parties, in light of reviewing the 1978 Presidential Records Act to the same standard. And ultimately, we are a reform and oversight, and the reform is the most important part of what we do. If the 1978 Act is not being properly adhered to or there needs to be additional legislation, we are empowered to do that. But to do it, we can't go on a witch hunt of Karl Rove or Andy Card. We have to, in fact, look at the activities and the practices. And Mr. Chairman, particularly, Mr. Chairman, particularly, I believe that as electronic mail, which did not exist in 1978 at the time of this act, becomes appropriate to look at, that the last two presidencies, the last 14 years is, is absolutely when email became the major thing that we want to look at. So, in fact, I believe that when we look at a 1978 act at a time in which only scientists and the military used email, we should look at both sides equally, uh, both because of burden and because of the resource it would give us for our oversight and reform activities. And so, Mr. Chairman, I strongly suggest that you view your uh, subpoena in light of the 1978 Presidential Records Act. I yield back. Further discussion on the point uh, of order? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair. Mr. Davis. Um, let me start by saying I think the basic information that you want to get from the RNC you ought to be entitled to get. Um, I, I sat here through the Loretta Doan hearings. I, the, the issues were raised. Uh, and I think the, the, what we're trying to get at is something that both parties want to get at. My concern about the breadth of this subpoena is that, that it is entirely too broad, that it becomes a fishing expedition where you basically have a Democratic majority that has not shared all of the information that they have gotten with us going through RNC emails and that it ought to be more narrowly uh, tailored. Often points of order are sustained on jurisdictional grounds in this committee where someone will offer a motion and it is not within the jurisdiction of this committee to act. In this particular case, this committee has the jurisdiction to act uh, on Mr. Ice's motion and if it is ruled out of order because of the you are you're narrowly tailoring the notice for this meeting, uh, then I will ask unanimous consent in the uh, uh, just for, for comity between us that it be allowed. I think it is important for us to take a look at these precedents of having individual computers uh, by White House personnel, that this didn't originate with the Bush administration, that this, in fact, came forward because they were trying to not use government computers for political operations, and political operations have been a part of White House's going back 50 years. It's not a Republican or Democratic issue, but that, and frankly, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, and that we ought to take a look at this in its entirety. Uh, once again, I think what the basics of what you're trying to get at here 
uh, from the RNC is information that Congress ought to have in moving forward and trying to get a better handle and understanding of how separate computers being used to evade presidential records, uh, if that's indeed what was happening. Uh, we, that we ought to have knowledge of that. But I think what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. And I want to put the committee on uh, record that if this is, uh, if the uh, point of order is not su uh, sustained in, or, or is sustained, they'll make a unanimous uh, uh, consent request at this point um, and ask everyone to join in and, and make sure that this is indeed a bipartisan investigation uh, to circumvent the Presidential Re Records Act, which should be the concern of all Americans, Republicans and Democrats. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Davis. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I, I do believe that uh, the motion uh, before us is, is uh, not germane. The RNC refused to provide basic information to this committee. The RNC refused to provide information that this committee requested. Therefore, the subpoena is going, uh, is, is, there's a, we're moving forward with the subpoena today. The uh, amendment that's in front of us is wide in its, in its reach, and, and there's no uh, indication that the National Democratic Committee has been asked by this committee t today to provide information that it has not. So I, it's very wide in scope. It's very, very broad. And the, s the specific subpoena being issued today is because the RNC refused to provide even the most basic information to this committee in order so that we could, we could move forward. The other reason why I don't find uh, th uh, this, this uh, uh, germane is because the White House um, correspondence doesn't allude to email, doesn't allude to telephone calls or whatever. There's White, Horse, White House correspondence that we are seeking because the RNC has failed to provide any of the requested documents to this committee to see if, in fact, they have been destroyed and if it's a correspondence that's between a White House official, the White House official is directed to keep that correspondence available for review. And the RNC has a policy of destroying um, their documentation after 30 days. You're very narrow in your focus in the subpoena. Uh, the motion before us is very broad, and it has nothing to do with the fact that the RNC refused to provide the most basic information. Therefore, I believe uh, that this uh, motion before us is not germane. Further debate Mr. on the point of order. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. McKenna. Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking to the question of germaneness and the point of order lodged against uh, consideration of, of uh, my colleague from Florida's amendment, the question before this committee is, is the Republican National Committee of jurisdiction of this committee. Well, actually, the operational uh, law that we're focused on here today deals with presidential records. Mm -hmm. That is the issue upon which this uh, motion by the chairman for subpoenas uh, relates. And so uh, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Ice's uh, amendment to this motion is germane because it's simply uh, redefines the email section. It redefines uh, White House. It, it actually re doesn't redefine White House officials. It just redefines the email section. And it is operational and it is germane based on those reasons and based on the law upon which this motion is offered by the chairman. Uh, furthermore, uh, if the chair rules that this is not germane, uh, he is simply saying that Nothing could be germane to his motion other than the Republican National Committee. And if that is the case, this is obviously a political witch hunt. That is obviously uh, a political witch hunt if the chair rules that this is not germane. And so I'd urge the chair to uh, look at the text uh, of his motion and uh, Chairman Ice's motion and appreciate the arguments being made on both sides on why this is uh, truly operational based on the 1978 Presidential Records Act. Will the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to put in that a, a previous um, a, a, a member in a previous comment said that the RNC had failed to comply with any of the document requests. That is not factual. They have not gone as far as I think the chairman would like. Uh, I ha would like to ask unanimous consent to put a letter from the law firm of Covington and Burling in the record today detailing their efforts to try to comply with the requests of the chairman. Without objection, that will be included in the record. 
For, uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Norton. Ms. Chairman, uh, uh, I, I, I was I was out of the room when when, when um, your your uh, uh, your uh, motion, new motion, was made. Um, I I do want to say how when when I first understood that we were subpoenaing a p political party, any political party, I had my my own misgivings until. Um, I received the assurances that you have given this this committee about the narrowness of 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 the subpoena. Moreover, the the amendment regarding the DNC documents I find quite amazing because if my concern was that one has to stop and consider before subpoenaing any political party, the first thing one has to ask is what is the predicate? The, the predicate was laid here in hearings where there was evidence, very specific evidence of the kind that this committee had jurisdiction over because of its jurisdiction over GSA. It suggests, that evidence suggests that particularly considering that the White House was involved, that the White House and those involved probably didn't stop with one agency and that there are Hatch Act and perhaps other violations and yes, violations containing uh, perhaps relating to security. But what predicate has been laid for a, a all out investigation of the DNC? If, in fact, we were to say, let's investigate both political parties as a general matter to see if political parties, both of them now, are complying with security regulations, Hatch Act regulations, and the rest, with no predicate laid that there may indeed have been a violation, I hope every Democrat and Republican on this committee would have his hand up and say uh, no. Um, um, the, the fact is that we had a witness before us who could recall nothing. We relied upon evidence in black and white. Um, this subpoena relates very and comes very specifically out of that hearing, which showed, it seems to me, without beyond reasonable doubt were that to apply, that there had been a, a Hatch Act violation. Uh, the, it seems to me there's an obligation on the part of this committee to see if what we had here were systematic violations by the RNC using the same kinds of approaches they used uh, with the GSA. I, uh, we well, have my colleague no yield. such evidence with respect to the DNC, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Further debate on the point of order? Mr. Chase. Uh, let me just yield to my Mr. chairman. Gentlemen, you may ranking member. Can I just want to put this in perspective. I understand we're, we're talking about a point of order on the RNC and the DNC, but one of the things that troubles me is, as I said before, I think the documents the chairman wants to get on this we would be supportive of. The difficulty is, and we just received this at 1045 last night, is that in the draft, uh, so subpoena, they asked for the total uh, un under um, paragraph 2C and D, they asked for the total number of electronic communications from an individual's RNC email account to an official government email account and the number sent from, from an individual assigned RNC email account from an official government email account. If it's sent to or from a government's email uh, account, it is preserved right now under the Presidential Records Act and therefore is not the business of this committee, at least un operating under the auspices of the Presidential Records Act, to get those kind of communications, unless it's a fishing expedition or there is some partisan exercise. There are other documents that I think should be within the purview of this committee, and we should understand. Uh, that may have been violations of the Hatch Act or the like. But in this particular case, I don't think it's right to subpoena a political party for records that are already preserved under the Act. 
And that is our concern, is the breadth of this, not whether they ought to be able to get certain documents that we all have an interest, I think, in preserving. And so I hope that, it, again, for partisan committee, we'll allow this to be in order, and if not, I'll ask unanimous consent that we can at least make this uh, bipartisan. Mr. Chairman, with, with my time, I, I feel like we're straining out gnats and swallowing camels. I feel like this committee is, while Rome burns, we're eating grapes. There are so many huge issues that we should be debating that my Democratic colleagues are right in saying we should debate. We have men and women risking their lives in Iraq as we speak, and I just would hope that sometime soon we can get back to some regular order. I just am very uncomfortable in general with the outreach that we have, the subpoenas that we have, going after the Secretary of State for something that occurred before the war even began. And I'm, so I'm, I just hope that sometime you're going to get back on track, but we're getting off track. Would back. the gentleman yield to me? I'd be happy to yield. Uh, Mr. Davis suggested that uh, all these emails are being preserved. Well, there are five uh, million missing emails. Five million. Uh, we asked the RNC to preserve their emails. We don't know whether other departments preserve their emails or not. I just want that, that people, uh, no one to be misinformed. If we, if we have a preservation of emails, uh, that's all to the good. But the RNC uh, ought to comply with our request, which is not for every email they have, but for those emails related to the issues well, under the gentleman yield, Mr. Chairman. I, well, gentleman, I, I gentleman, I gentleman from uh, Connecticut's time. I, you, gentlemen, I mean, I think the concern here is that under the law, if these are put into the government system, they have to be preserved. That's the f that, that is my understanding of the law. So they are in the government system. Now, if somebody circumvented that, there is no evidence of that. And I think this becomes a big, giant fishing expedition. But once again, to try to get at the documents that the gen gentleman wants, we are happy to work with him. Uh, but, but I, again, I, a very broadly crafted subpoena where you can go uh, fishing onto Republican National Committee uh, computers and see what else you might turn up is just something I don't think is within the purview of the statute or what this committee ought to be well, doing. Well, the gentleman from Connecticut yield to me again on this point. The Presidential Record Act applies to presidential records. I don't know if I don't think it, it applies to government agencies. Uh, we found out about it because of our inquiry into the GSA. But the fact of the matter is uh, I'm not sure they're all preserved, and we've asked for records. Uh, some of the records may not even be there, and, um, uh, but we ought to, we ought to unfortunately, have to, we, ha we have to issue a subpoena to get the emails we've requested. Well, it, it, the Federal Records Act would, would handle, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, what the Presidential Rac Records Act didn't. Further uh, debate on the point like, of order. I'd like to. Uh, on the comment. point of order, yes. the gentleman is yes. recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, you know, I, I did note that the parliamentarian had ruled uh, against uh, my motion, and my motion would have expanded to name an individual. Um, and I can see the interpretation uh, on that particular point of order, even though I would like, I'm going to continue to insist on appealing uh, the ruling of the chair on that. But I do believe that in fairness, um, uh, again, uh, and also in germaneness, uh, we've, we have now limited with the, uh, the pending uh, motion before us or amendment before us uh, to uh, the DNC and the RNC. Uh, when I, and, and I spoke at the beginning that I, uh, I participated in the GSA hearing and I was surprised to hear along with other members and the chairman of the procedure of these political briefings, and I thought we should look at that. But I don't think it's fair uh, and honestly fair for us to proceed in not looking at, at how this has been conducted over uh, the, the number of years and by both sides of the aisle. Uh, I think it is un 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 unfair to just point this in a political partisan fashion to the, the RNC. I know these briefings were conducted before. I'm, I'm sure these briefings were conducted uh, in, uh, in the Speaker's office, the, the current Speaker's office, uh, political briefings, uh, the previous Speaker's office, and in uh, federal buildings. And, uh, and I think it's only fair, again, that 
uh, that, uh, that we do allow. Gentlemen, uh, yield to me. If you have evidence of wrongdoing in Congress, it ought to be reported immediately to the Ethics Committee. Uh, that had been the position. Well, it's my, sus it's my suspicion, I should say. I don't have hard evidence, but we don't have hard evidence that there was a misdeed uh, by the presentation of this, but I did agree with the chair and others when we found out of this procedure of providing these uh, uh, political briefings. I know that there were political offices in the White House uh, uh, back in the Clinton administration. I think in all fairness that we should see how everyone conducted this. And as we heard others, our responsibility is to conduct oversight and then reform, correct the process so that the, if there are violations, they don't occur and bring to light uh, what has taken place and any, any uh, misdeeds and hold people accountable. So I, I appeal on that basis that we have uh, redefined um, uh, and defined very carefully and ask for uh, fair and equitable treatment and consideration uh, of the question before us that's been put by the, the chair and now amended uh, by the gentleman from California, proposed to be amended. Thank you, Mr. Micah. The chair is prepared to rule on the point of order. We have consulted with the parliamentarian of the House of Representatives on this specific amendment. And the parliamentarian has informed us that under the rules of the House which guide this committee, the amendment is not germane. Therefore, the point of order from the gentleman uh, from New York Mr. is Chairman, sustained. Mr. Chairman, I appeal the ruling of the chair. Uh, gentleman appeals the ruling of the chair, and without objection, that uh, vote will uh, come uh, uh, later when we take all the Mr. other Chairman, votes. Mr. Chairman, can I make a unanimous consent request? The parliamentarian ruled this not because this is not within the purview of this committee to issue the subpoena uh, that was requested. Uh, by the gentleman from California. It certainly is within the purview of the committee to do that. So it was not on jurisdictional grounds. I think it was narrowly ta uh, tailored because of the notice that was sent out. So we have the jurisdiction. I would ask unanimous consent that the committee be allowed to consider that and make it in order. Reserving uh, the right to object. Yeah, you don't have to object. You can you, okay, go ahead. Now, I want to reserve the right to object because I'd like to, s to point some things out. Uh, I thought the gentle lady from the District of Columbia pointed out that there was no predicate for this proposal that we examine the DNC, but there has been a factual predicate to look at the Republican National Committee, because we have seen instances where people working in the White House have used the RNC account apparently for official uh, business. But for those who are anxious to find out what happened at the DNC, presumably that would have been during the last administration, I want the members just to know that between 1997 and 2001, this committee issued at least 34 information requests to the DNC, including 10 subpoenas, 19 requests for documents and information, five sets of interrogatories. The committee got all records relating to several DNC officials, all records relating to contacts between the DNC Finance Division staff and the White House from 93 to 97, all records relating to any meetings held at the White House attended by the DNC, all records relating to any White House computer database which had to be reconstructed so that they could comply with this, all records relating to expenses DNC reimbursed, whether it was the expenses of the First Family or travel on Air Force One or Air Force Two or Marine helicopters, all re records relating to a long list of White House officials, Stephanopoulos, Jack Quinn, Cheryl Mills, Harold Ickes, Bruce Lindsay, Doug Sosnick, all records relating to the Department of Commerce, Justice, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Energy, National Security Council, dating back to the first year of the Clinton presidency, all records relating to Clinton's Birthplace Foundation and the Hope Foundation, all records relating to many different Democratic fundraisers and uh, donors. In response, the DNC produced over 600,000 pages of documents to this committee. These documents included substantial production from the files of the DNC chairman, the DNC finance director, the DNC general counsel, and many other DNC officials. And I can give you examples of those documents. And after all that was received, there was no evidence that there was any wrongdoing by the White House or the DNC. Mr. Chairman. They were spent millions of dollars on all of this. Mr. Chairman, will you yield? I, I will yield to you in a minute. And there was no evidence of wrongdoing. Now, if you want to plow, as they say in the law, old ground, or as we see colloquially, beat a dead horse, 
then we are to get the DNC files so you can look at them again. But you've had them all. And what we are asking for is the RNC uh, emails because they haven't been produced uh, to us. So uh, I, I, um, I, I'm going to yield to, the, to uh, the, uh, Mr. Mr. Burton, but uh, I will, uh, at the appropriate time, make an objection to the unanimous consent request. Gentlemen, Mr. Mr. Burton. Chairman. Mr. Chil uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I had not anticipated really participating in this debate, but it's become necessary because you're going back to a great deal of things that took place when I was the chairman of the committee, and, and I think it's imperative that the record be made correct from, from my perspective, and, and I'm sure you're going to disagree. We had, when I was chairman, over 100 people take the Fifth Amendment or flee the country regarding the campaign finance scandal. They were leaving the country. They wouldn't talk to us. Uh, we had to issue subpoenas because we had to catch them before they left the country. Now, I talked to Chuck Ruff, who was the chief counsel at the White House, and he came down and he told me he was going to be completely cooperative and the White House was going to give us all the information we wanted. Subsequent to that, we couldn't get anything. They changed their mind. And so subpoenas were a necessity because we couldn't get the information. Uh, there were campaign contributions. We had testimony that there were campaign contributions that came from the communist government, uh, from, a, from, a, from a source that was at the meeting when the, when the campaign contributions allegedly took place. We had uh, people testify that Indonesia, the, uh, the Lippo group in Indonesia gave well over a million or two million dollars to the Clinton administration. Uh, there was money that came in from uh, South America that had to be checked on. And, and it was a necessity that we issue those subpoenas. Now you were, chair you were the ranking Democrat at the time, Mr. Chairman, and you rightfully objected to what we were doing because you were trying to protect your administration, President Clinton, and the Democrat Party. But we had to try to get to the truth because there were all kinds of allegations of wrongdoing. We had testimony at that table where people were saying that they witnessed illegal campaign contributions coming in to the White House and to the Clinton administration. And we couldn't get any cooperation, so we had to issue those subpoenas. The only reason I issued those subpoenas without consulting sure. with the minority was because every time we tried to issue subpoenas, uh, on this issue. This is the kind of thing we went into. And when we had so many people leaving the country so rapidly or taking the Fifth Amendment, we had to move rapidly. And that's why I issued subpoenas as quickly as possible. So I just wanted to uh, set the record straight. And, and regarding outside the campaign contributions uh, scandal that took place, uh, the second most wanted person on the FBI list, Mark Rich, was pardoned by the Clinton administration. And there was some question. Mr. Chairman. Now let me just finish. Red lights on. Yeah, no. It's a, okay. Gentlemen, uh, if there was some question whether or not Mark Rich, through intermediaries, was giving money to the White House, or and, and there was also what? questions about a drug dealer in California giving campaign contributions, giving money to Bill Clinton's brother. All these things had to be checked out, and that's why we issued the numerous sub subpoenas we did. And I'm glad you let me put this on the record. Mr. Thank Chairman. You, Mr. Burton, uh, we're ready to uh, the, uh, there's an objection to the um, unanimous consent request. The chair will ask if there are further amendments to the proposed subpoena. If not, the previous question is ordered and we will take the vote on that subpoena, but we will roll all the votes uh, until uh, at the end of this meeting. The second matter before us is an additional subpoena and um, uh, and this is my motion. I move that the committee direct the chairman to execute and issue a subpoena to the Republican National Committee seeking documents concerning the January 26, 2007 PowerPoint presentation attended by J. J. Scott Jennings, other similar political briefings provided at federal agencies, the use of federal agencies or resources to help Republican candidates, agreements between the RNC and other government entities concerning the use of RNC email accounts, policies, procedures, and communications concerning the use of these accounts, including preservation, storage, or destruction of the emails transmitted using the accounts. Um, 
that's the uh, proposal before us. Um, and so I can clarify it. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, earlier this year, the committee learned of a partisan political briefing that was provided by the White House Office of Political Affairs to officials of the General Services Administration. This briefing, which reported on the results of the 2006 election and provided the GOP plan, GOP plan of attack for the 2008 election, was held at GSA headquarters and was broadcast over a video feed to GSA offices nationwide. At the end of the event, the GSA administrator asked, how can we use GSA to help our candidates in the next election? Several aspects of this partisan strategic event may have violated the Federal Hatch Act. Despite the possible violation of federal law inherent in this event, this, president, this presentation apparently wasn't a one-time occurrence. A White House spokesperson described the GSA briefing as a regular communication from the White House to political appointees. And according to press reports, Karl Rove and his top aides have been giving similar presentations to political appointees on a regular basis throughout the entire six years of the Bush administration. The Los Angeles Times noted yesterday that at, at these presentations, employees said they got a not so subtle message about helping endangered Republicans. The presentation at the GSA was given by a White House official, J. Scott Jennings, but he and his assistant corresponded with GSA officials about the event using their RNC emails. In order for the committee to conduct oversight of this and similar briefings, it must request emails sent through RNC accounts. The White House systems may have no record at all of these briefings. On April 4th, the committee asked the RNC for a specific and limited set of emails sent or received by White House officials using the RNC accounts. Specifically, the committee asked for emails that relate to the January 2007 briefing at GSA, emails that relate to s similar political briefings given at federal agencies or to employees of federal agencies, and emails that relate to the use of federal resources to assist Republican candidates for office. To date, all the committee has received in response are excuses, delays, and requests to use search terms that are so limited that they would exclude the emails we already received from the GSA. As a result, I'm asking the committee to approve the subpoena. The subpoena asks the RNC to provide the emails described above. It also asks for several previously requested documents, including policies and procedures regarding the use of the RNC email accounts and communications from federal entities regarding the preservation, storage, or destruction of emails. This is a narrow subpoena and it is a reasonable one, and I urge its approval. And I, I urge its approval. Uh, any, uh, any member wish to be uh, heard on this uh, motion that's before us? Uh, without objection, it's, it's considered open and uh, subject to an amendment at any point. Gentleman uh, from California, Mr. Uh, Eisen. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will uh, read the amendment. Gentleman from New York, Mr. Mo Towns, reserves a point of order on the amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could he wait until he sees it to reserve a point of order? Uh, a point of order is reserved because it must be reserved and it doesn't need to be pursued until we see whether a point of order would be appropriate. So we're going to have point of orders on everything? The clerk uh, would read the, uh, the uh, motion. Motion amendment by Mr. Issa. Motion to amend subpoena to the RNC for documents. The January 20th, I have an amendment to the motion to Subpoena the Republican National Committee seeking documents. The chairman has moved to subpoena the following documents. The January 26, 2007 PowerPoint presentation. Your motion, is this your motion or your speech? No, I think they may What is said, your amendment? The amendment would limit the terms. I, uh, it would uh, amend the motion requiring the RNC to the following such terms complying with the enforcement and the terms would be the GSA, general service, et cetera. That's the amendment. I, I apologize. I did not write this, so they should be switching for the actual okay, amendment please. language. Uh, just a okay, moment. without objection, the amendment is considered read. The uh, gentleman from California is recognized to explain Th his you. amendment, and the gentleman from New York still has a point of order reserved. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this one uh, is absolutely positively in order and requires a vote. All we are doing is limiting, as to the RNC, the entity that you said 
in no uncertain terms, you are in fact subpoenaing, we're limiting it to the language that was suggested since no counter language. Certainly the uh, chair is free to issue another subpoena if he's not satisfied with the production, but this would include, as you said earlier, Mr. Chairman, the GSA, the General Services Administration, uh, PowerPoint, political briefings, uh, appointees, Hatch Act in 2008, uh, and I would strongly suggest that if you're unwilling to accept these, that you, pr you propound your own terms that would be reasonable uh, in, for anyone to do discovery, since in fact this is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars of time uh, that can only be taken out of hard dollars uh, to the advantage of the DNC and to the detriment of the Republicans on a partisan basis if you, pr if you insist on overly burdensome discovery. Uh, we also, uh, in my amendment, uh, give 90 days to respond, a reasonable amount of time to produce, fil filter, evaluate, and deliver this information. Uh, that's the essence of this. Gen Clearly Gen within Gen the Gen Germanian yield for a second. I would yield to the uh, ranking member. Uh, let me just note, I just go back and, and, and talk to when this discussion came in and, and the roles were reversed. And Chairman Burton was chairman, and, and, uh, uh, and at that point, Mr. Chairman, you said the continual, uh, the Duplication of the Senate's work suggests the real objective may not be the truth, but to drive the Democratic Party further into debt. And I'm nervous here. We're trying to we are trying to get these documents in as an efficient way as we can, but these obviously come out of Republican campaign coffers to pay for this. And I think we need to be very constructive in tailoring an appropriate subpoena that narrows the scope and just doesn't drive up costs. And that's that's been my concern from the beginning. We have a right to get certain documents, but this has turned into a giant fishing expedition. Gentlemen, yield to me further so I, I can understand this amendment. You're limiting it, and what are you excluding? We're not excluding. We're providing the terms which they would provide all, all documents responsive to the words GS, the initials GSA, the General Service Administration, et cetera. These words or initials, which are the, sub which are the logical subjects of this investigation, <laughs> if any document contains any part of this, it would clearly be within the scope of the subpoena. It does not change the fact that, that those documents could well lead us to other documents. However, this is something, as you know, Mr. Chairman, that a computer can search on, and they can deliver us all documents that contain, for example, General Service Administration. Now, it's impossible to send something to the General Service Administration and not have GSA in it or General Service, or to talk about a presentation that is going to be made at the General Service Administration, or for that matter, uh, appointees, uh, any and all appointees. And certainly, if the chairman wanted to further amend this to, in to include maybe other initials related to appointees, but a defined list, and I've put this forward as a, as a fair amendment, a defined list that they deliver all that are responsive to can be done by a computer in the tens of thousands of dollars rather than perhaps a million dollars or more, uh, clearly showing that you do not intend to drive the Republican Party further into debt, but rather get fair and reasonable discovery. And that's why I've done this. Okay. The gentleman, uh, uh, first of all, the chair will state that this is a germane amendment and the gentleman from New York there for withdraws his point of order. So there is no point of order on germaneness. Uh, on the merits uh, discussion, Mr. Van Hollen. I think we need to begin with what the overall issue here uh, is with respect to this request. And there's clear evidence that the Bush administration was using federal taxpayer resources for political purposes. I mean, we only have to go back to the briefing paper that we received from the GSA showing the Karl Rove briefing listing the top House Democratic targets for 2008. And I think the American taxpayers would be greatly concerned and upset when they understood that their dollars were being used by the White House for political purposes. There have been lots of questions raised as to whether this was just GSA specific or something that happened in other agencies. The way you've got your amendment drafted, you just mentioned GSA. We already know what happened in GSA. This you're, you would prevent us from, for example, looking at whether or not there were RNC documents that showed that U.S. taxpayer dollars were used for political purposes at other agencies. Would the gentleman let me, yield? Let me just, on the, on the other side, I think that your folks at the uh, RNC would be 
greatly upset if we ran a search on every document with the year 2008 in it and got every document that popped out with 2008. This just, this approach shows the shortcoming of trying to limit this by computer searches this way. There's a, as you know, there are rules that are followed with respect to document requests and relevancy issues that come up right. with document requests. Gentlemen yield. And by narrowing the scope, uh, in this way, you prevent people from looking to what I think, as I understood what the ranking member said, Mr. Davis, that there are documents that he believes we legitimately should have. And I think he would agree that if there's a document at the RNC showing that the another government agency, other than GSA, was involved in US, using U.S. taxpayer dollars for political purposes, I think the ranking member would agree that that's a legitimate Gentlemen, document you, to have. I happy. just want to point out that under the limitations that have been proposed, um, uh, we, we contacted the RNC because they suggested these limitations and we said the search terms that they proposed would not have located a January 19, 2007 email from an official in Karl Rove's office to an official at the General Services Administration transmitting a copy of the PowerPoint slides prepared by the White House that lists the top 20 Democratic targets in 2008. And the email read, please do not email this out or let people see it. It is a close hold and we're not supposed to be emailing it around. Well, that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been um, part, of the, part of the information we would have received if we would have limited the search as uh, requested by the gentleman from California. Would, would the gentleman yield? further yield? Uh, this is in response, as you may not be aware, but uh, for your help, this is in response to the RNC responding and saying, we suggest these terms. However, if you'll give us such terms as you see reasonable, again, it, it, we have an obligation to not be overly burdensome. Uh, if 2008 is overly broad, we can certainly take it out. But we, the, the, the onus is on us to be fair and reasonable in what we're asking for leading to discovery. Right now, we're asking for everything. So I agree with the chairman that if something is left out by a particular search, we should include it. But it's very clear that if we simply say, give us all, we are going on a fishing expedition. And as you can imagine, if the answer is, did you do anything wrong ever, well, uh, that's not a fair, particularly in light of the likelihood that the DNC will not be asked for the same question, that again is not appropriate to fair discovery of oversight. So, you know, I would, I would urge the gentleman to do a secondary amendment uh, on this, uh, or the chairman, uh, because I'm more than happy to have all the reasonable search terms. But as you can imagine, the alternative to search terms is Okay, give us your disk drives and let us look through your campaign finance records. Let us look through how you, how you recruit and get people to give you money. Let's look at what you said about other candidates. Obviously, that's not a fair, uh, that's an attack on a political process. It's not a discovery by a government entity. And remember, we're supposed to not be using federal money to, in fact, affect outcomes of election. At some point, we cross that line, and we are, in fact, affecting the outcome of election by taking Mr. away the dollars Mr. and using federal dollars to do it. Re reclaiming my time, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I I'm just looking at the subject matter that the subpoena that proposed by the, the chairman, the, the, the subject matters. Uh, one is a specific PowerPoint presentation of J. Scott uh, Jennings. The other, similar political briefings provided at federal agencies. I mean. If you really think there are that many documents at the RNC regarding political briefings at federal agencies is going to be a burden, then we really do have a serious problem here. Number three, use of federal agencies or resources to help Republican candidates. That's using the federal power of the purse, for example, to go after the targets on the Karl Rove list or to help the Republican members on the Karl Rove list. Again, if there are lots of, if there are lots of emails at the RNC, on that subject matter, I think you'd be hard pressed to say that we're not entitled to them, and that would be an abuse of uh, federal government and federal taxpayer resources. So, Mr. Chairman, I gentlemen's think time has expired. Mr. Chairman, been limited. Chairman. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Thank you, Mr. Shays. Thank you. Um, I wasn't certain I was going to get into this debate, but when the head of the DCCC starts lecturing us on politics in government, I begin to feel like I'm in Russia right now where one party that now has this opportunity is going to go after the other party using the government. You're using the government resources even as we speak. You're going to use all these government-paid staff even as we speak. 
I, I don't know if there's anyone on the other side of the aisle who's beginning to wonder about this, but you should. But gentlemen, you, you I'd like you. to Chairman. say, well, gentlemen, you. I'd like to just say though, Chairman. I am going to vote to support the chairman's rulings because they are rulings based on what our rules are, and I'm going to abide by those rules, even though I disagree with the fact that we aren't going to be debating them. And I just want it understood when I vote to sustain the ruling of the chair, I'm not voting in support of the issue. Well, well, gentlemen, you. I'm happy to yield. No, no, Let you, me you, make you. a couple of comments. First of all, I appreciate the chairman uh, allowing the committee to vet this out. Uh, as, a, as I noted before, he, has, he could issue these subpoenas uh, without consulting with anyone. That hasn't been our tradition working together. Um, but he wanted, he, he's allowed us to vet this out, and we're doing that today. What bothers me about the, these two motions is not the fact that we're trying to get information that we ought to have. I think we're doing that. But in my opinion, as I've outlined earlier, these are far overreaching. Puts a tremendous burden on the Republican National Committee to spend literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands, if not more than that, in hiring attorneys and hiring uh, people to go search emails and the like. And this is politics in its rawest form. I wish that the chairman had sat down with us and decided how we could scope a very narrow based uh, subpoena and request for documents that we could have agreed on because I think we could have worked it out. Um, I think we are all appalled. Uh, we, we know there has always been politics at the White House. This has happened under previous administrations as well, but that they are sending this out to agencies and would like to be able to redefine those boundaries. But the scope of this thing was done so that we didn't get a copy of the, of the motion until last night at 730 without real input from us, and at 1045 got a copy of the subpoena. And it is far in excess, in my judgment, of what it ought to be. And had we had a chance to sit in a room for an hour and go back and forth, we probably could have scoped something out that would have met the majority's need and the American people's need to get information without overburdening the minority Republican Party at this point. Uh, and I think that this is just politics in its rawest form at this point. Let's do a big fishing expedition. Let's make these guys pay. And uh, I just, uh, I, I don't think it's right. I think it's an overreach. Again, I just uh, hold out the olive branch to work with the chairman to try to find some uh, satisfaction that the two parties can combine and go to the RNC and say this is what we need without having to go through uh, a very broad-based, expensive process at this point to try to get documents, most of which have no relevance uh, to what we're trying to do at all. Gentleman from Mr. Connecticut, yield to me. Yes, I will. I, uh, I hear what you're all saying about burdening the Republican National Committee, and I do want to be reasonable about all this. We've asked them for information. We've asked them to limit the scope, to suggest what scope that uh, they would comply with. We've asked them how many emails are involved. Instead, we got no responses to scope that they would recommend, and we got some information on the number of gigabytes, which doesn't tell us how many emails were involved. Now, I would suggest that we vote the subpoena, and then we will be pleased to talk to the RNC and the Republican members of this committee to see if they can uh, come to some terms with us on the, a more limited scope. But we want the information that we're entitled to. I want to say to the, my friend from Connecticut, I know you think you're living in a Stalinist country when uh, a couple of subpoenas are being requested. But you did allow a chairman of your own party to issue over a thousand subpoenas. You not only allowed him to do it, you voted to give him that power. And I'm trying to exercise power in a m moderate way and trying to bring everybody on board. Okay. And I hope we can continue to talk okay. e with each we, other. We, we Mr. Chairman, a little bit of time. Gentlemen's time. Mr. Chairman, uh, I do Mr. want to thank the, the gentleman, the chairman, for allowing a debate. And I, uh, I, I, I want that not to go unnoticed. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentlelady from uh, California, Ms. White. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for your fairness. Uh, I'm over here on your far left, and uh, I've been watching that clock, and certainly those people on your right uh, have had plenty of time. Uh, I'm inquiring about, uh, it seems like the time is running out, and we have not gotten to our five minutes to debate the three issues that were in, that are germane that were in front of us. So I'm inquiring about how much time uh, we all have obligations in uh, trying to uh, be a good team player 
it's at 10 to 12. So my inquiry is, uh, how much time do you think will be allowed for this committee meeting? I certainly want to be here for the vote. Well, General Lady, uh, if you'll permit, um, we have a pending uh, amendment offered by Mr. Issa. Uh, I'm ready to proceed to the vote if the members are ready to proceed to the vote. All right. And then we can move on to uh, uh, final passage of the uh, subpoena before us. Without Th objection, the previous you. question is ordered. All those in favor of the ICE amendment will M say aye. M M M All those opposed, no. Well, uh, reserve, no. Re reserving the right to object, Mr. Chairman. I, I, well, the noes appear to have it. What, what is, well, what is I just it? was going you to want, say. You a, want the a lot of our, voted? No, a lot of our members who uh, would like to be here for the vote uh, uh, aren't here, and, and uh, I'm sure that we might want to. Uh, have uh, Mr. Burton, let us do this. Uh, you will ask for a roll call. We will grant a roll call, and we'll have that roll call okay. at the same time we have the other roll call. I, I request a roll call. Okay. Vote. Are there other amendments to this particular pending subpoena? If not, the uh, previous question is ordered on that. We will now con uh, move to our third and last uh, proposal that is before us, a subpoena um, to, um, uh, to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice to testify before the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform on May 15, 2007. And uh, that subpoena is uh, uh, before us without uh, the, the without, without unanimous consent, the reading of the, of the uh, subpoena will be waived. And I will explain uh, why I am seeking authorization for this particular uh, subpoena. The committee uh, seeks the Secretary's testimony on several matters, including key unanswered questions about her role in the administration's use of the fabricated claim that Iraq sought uranium in Niger, as well as other issues. And I'm disappointed that the Secretary has put the committee in this position. I had hoped the Secretary would be willing to voluntarily appear before the committee, but she's refused. And we've reached this point only after the committee's many attempts to obtain information from the Secretary have, have failed. And I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about Dr. Rice's role in statements regarding the claim the administration made that Iraq sought uranium in Niger. The administration's claim that Iraq could pose a nuclear threat was at the center of its case for war. Indeed, this assertion was key to the decision of many members of Congress, including myself, to support the resolution authorizing the use of force in Iraq. It therefore raised enormously serious questions when Congress and the public learned that there were flaws, with not just minor ones, but serious flaws with the intelligence underpinning the administration's nuclear case. On January 28, 2003, the President said his famous 16 words, claiming in the State of the Union the most heavily vetted speech a President makes, that Iraq sought uranium from Africa. Yet three months later, UN inspectors announced that the support for that claim, purported letters between Iraq and Niger, were nothing but crude forgeries. By June, Condoleezza Rice had taken to the airwaves to defend the White House and cast the blame on the intelligence community. Appearing on multiple national news shows, she claimed that the intelligence committee, excuse me, quote, the intelligence community did not know at that time or at levels that got to us that this, that there were serious questions about that report, end quote. This statement was false. In October 2002, the CIA sent two memos to the White House warning against using the Niger claim. One of those memos was addressed directly to Secretary Rice. Both were addressed to her top deputy, Stephen Hadley, and her replacement, by the way, at the National Security Council. And to reinforce the points in the memo, the director of the CIA called Mr. Hadley personally to ask him to remove the claim from a speech the President was giving in Cincinnati. Ms. Rice's statement also contradicted the National Intelligence Estimate issued uh, in October 2002. The NIE is a document that the Secretary Rice cites repeatedly to justify her position. But the NIE states explicitly that the State Department, the Department Secretary Rice now runs, found the claims highly dubious. The State Department doubts about Iraq's nuclear capabilities were not buried in the NIE. The key judgments section of the NIE contains a detailed discussion of the State Department's alternative view of Iraq's nuclear program. 
In the past four years, I have written multiple letters to Secretary Rice to learn more about the fabricated Niger claim. The first reply I ever received was last month. Since then, I have received two additional letters. The gist of the letters is that the Secretary either didn't know about the forged evidence or forgot what she knew. Uh, her staff has also suggested that the Secretary is too busy to answer these questions. The claim about Iraq's nuclear capability was the centerpiece of the administration's case for war. It led to a war in which thousands of American men and women have lost their lives or been severely injured. It has led to a war that has cost many, many lives and injuries of the Iraqi people. Congress and the American public deserves a better explanation than I forgot or I didn't read the memo. The Republicans on this committee had four years to investigate this misleading intelligence that got us into the war in Iraq, but they didn't hold one hearing. They didn't issue one subpoena, and they didn't even ask a single question. We will hear today that there have already been several investigations into why the intelligence about Iraq was so wrong. There have been some investigations, but they all looked at the, sa the mistakes made by the intelligence agencies. There has been no inquiry about what went wrong inside the White House. And the stack of papers that Mr. Davis is about to hold up to show that this has been thoroughly investigated will not show any investigation of what went wrong inside the White House. There was one person in the White House who had the primary responsibility to get the intelligence about Iraq right, and that was now Secretary Rice who was at that time President Bush's national security advisor. She has never testified in public about what she may know about how the intelligence was used or misused by the White House. That is all we are asking her to do. The days of averting our eyes from the hard questions are over. The American public was misled about the threat posed by Iraq, and this committee is going to do its part to find out why. So I urge members to support this subpoena. And I now recognize uh, uh, Mr. Davis for five minutes. These questions have been asked and answered. Again, uh, three detailed reports, over 1,500 pages. Uh, one uh, by the House of Commons in Britain, talking about the state of uh, intelligence at that time. One on a report to the President of the United States interviewed White House and administration personnel by former Senator Robb and Mr. Silberman, 700 pages. This is the Commission on the Intelligence Capabilities Regarding Weapons of Mass Destruction. And finally, a report on the U.S. intelligence community's pre-war intelligence assessments in Iraq that includes lengthy discussions on Niger. This was by the Intelligence Committee, unanimous report by the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee at this point. So this has been vetted. Uh, Secretary uh, Rice uh, has been has answered these questions. In fact, she was in her confirmation for Secretary of State addressed a number of the issues under oath that uh, Mr. Waxman wants to bring up uh, uh, before today. My concern is number one. I, I don't know of any record of a Secretary of State ever having appeared before this committee before. We are not a committee of jurisdiction. We're a committee of oversight. In the last Congress, because of the intelligence nature of these issues, we obviously deferred to committees uh, uh, on intelligence, uh, defense, uh, foreign relations, other com uh, committees that have jurisdiction on these issues uh, to ask those type of questions. Um, but what concerns me is, again, over the next two months, which is when these subpoenas would take place, is she supposed to cancel her trip to Oslo, Norway, for the meeting with NATO foreign ministers, cut out her travel to Egypt for the Iraq Neighbors Conference, something that the majority has urged her uh, to do, travel to Russia, cut that out, uh, move her travel to the Middle East to continue negotiations with the Middle East, or cut out her travels to Asia to discuss, among other things, a six-party response to North Korea, um, and a number of other uh, uh, issues which I have previously noted. Um, chairman has written 16 letters uh, and says that he's only responded satisfactorily uh, to five of them. Uh, satisfactorily is in the eye of the beholder. He sent 54 letters to the Department of State from January 2003 to April 2007, 25 of which have been, and I ask unanimous consent that they go into the record. 
with the exception of a February Without objection, that will be the With the exception order. of a February 17th letter in which the Department has no record of receiving but has since addressed, all of these letters have received a response and in the overwhelming majority of cases a formal response. This doesn't include letters addressed to Dr. Uh, Rice when she was National Security Advisor. Some of these letters were not answered. But the Committee does not, of course, have the same oversight responsibilities with regard to the White House staff as it does with the State Department. Um, all of his, Mr. Waxman's 54 letters uh, received a response. Some of them were signed by himself, some with other members, uh, some by Republicans. One of the issues the Committee is examining is why the President uh, asserted in his State of the Union address in 2003 that Iraq sought uranium from Niger. The facts concerning the Iraq-Africa uranium connection and its inclusion in the President's State of the Union address have been extensively covered in at least three separate report and investigations, which we have uh, already presented here. Uh, Thousands of man hours involving hundreds of interviews have been spent in these investigations. The relevant documents were provided uh, to the Senate Committee, which analyzed and discussed them in great detail in a large section of its 500 plus page report in 2004. Um, we have already gone through some of the other issues about uh, what she knew about the fabricated Niger claim. She has spoken publicly and in detail on this issue on more than one occasion, including a July 11, 2003 press conference a July 30, 2003 television interview on PBS and other media appearances and interviews. These were provided to the committee. She has said, among other things, that when the line was put into the President's State of the Union address and cleared by the CIA, when I read the line, I thought it was completely credible and that, in fact, it was backed by the agency. That is her testimony. She is not going to change it when she comes up here under oath, but she is going to take a day or two to prepare for the testimony, a day out of her work schedule to come up here. She's answered these questions, asked and answered. What she hasn't done is given the answers that this committee would like. She has also said that knowing what we know now, that some of the Niger documents were apparently forged, we wouldn't have put this in the President's speech. But that's knowing what we know now. That's conceded. So where do we go with more investigation? Furthermore, Senator Levin asked a series of very similar questions in 2005 when her confirmation came up as Secretary of State. Among other things, she stated, I do not recall intelligence community concerns about the reports of Iraq's attempts to obtain uranium from Africa either at the time of the Cincinnati speech or the State of the Union speech. With these answers provided, the U.S. Senate subsequently voted to confirm her as Secretary. And now this committee is stepping in on another fishing expedition. Um, on the actual date that is proposed in the subpoenas, she is scheduled to be in Israel uh, with meeting with Israelis and Palestinians for discussions in that region. I just have to ask you, is coming before this committee and repeating what she said before that has been thoroughly investigated more important than that? Now, rest our case. This is unprecedented for this committee to delve into this. Again, this is raw party, party politics, and um, I'm going to have to uh, oppose uh, the, the issuance of the subpoena. Will the gentleman yield? I would be happy to. I just want to point out that we have given her complete flexibility on selecting a date. Uh, the date that we selected was a, a date because we wanted a date, we were certainly are willing to accommodate her schedule. I think a Secretary of State or a public official of, of, Mrs. of Dr. Rice's stature in making the decisions she has uh, she ought to be able to testify before a committee of the Congress. I don't think her press conferences or her TV interviews are sufficient. And uh, you pointed out that we don't have the same oversight jurisdiction that we have over White House staff that we do over a department. Maybe that's why she never bothered to respond in all the years uh, when we were in the minority that we wrote to her and when she was uh, the National Security Advisor. But we also wrote to her many times when she was the uh, Secretary of State. We want to ask her questions and get them on the record. I think the American people are entitled to that, and I, uh, I, I respectfully disagree with you. But, Mr. Chairman, let me just add up. I know my time is up. But, but uh, my concern here is, is jurisdictional as well. Uh, she has at least four other committees which have jurisdiction over some of her actions that this committee does. And this committee has oversight jurisdiction, but it doesn't have jurisdiction in a legislative way. She's testified already seven times this year before Congress where members from both parties can ask her anything. And I, I think it is unprecedented for this committee to bring her up here uh, when these questions have been asked and answered and examined and reexamined many times. It's great headlines to bring the Secretary of State in here and ask her to repeat something she said before. But I don't think it does us any good in terms of uh, investigations at this point. And I want to work with the Chairman to, to try to continue to work with State if he feels questions are unanswered. But bringing the Secretary of State here 
uh, before the cameras is not only a waste of her time, but I think it demeans what this committee is trying to do. The uh, motion is before us, and we've heard uh, two sides. Mr. Uh, Chairman. If the, if, if I would like to proceed to a, a vote, but if members do wish to uh, speak, then they'll be recognized. We'll, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, who seeks recognition on this side? Mr. Tierney, did you want to speak? I, I don't want to say anything too long. I just, you know, I noticed it, it seven times, I think, the member indicated that the secretary had been here to speak and before Congress. She's been on Fox News about 20 times and on uh, Larry King and on every, everything. I mean, this is not a question of sure not having the time. If Congress has legitimate questions as we do, then the secretary, I'm sure, uh, should make the time and be here. This is far more important than uh, some of the other activities that uh, sometimes uh, may occur. Not that she shouldn't do those things, but that she has an obligation, I think, to respond to the oversight uh, body of Congress. These are legitimate questions, and uh, we should move forward on that basis. Thank w you. Would the gentleman yield on his yes, time to, to the, uh, the Republican side? And if, of course, if they need more time to make the arguments, they'll be able to recognize that. Anybody else want time over here? Did you want time? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a, I have a yield, question. Yield his time. Ge General ladies uh, yielded to recognize. I I was l listening to your statement, and I don't believe we have a copy of the statement, but I wanted to make sure that I heard something that you said correctly. Um, and again, not having, having the statement in front of me, I can't go to it. But you mentioned a statement, statement that the vote. secretary okay. gave, and then you said, as, if I heard it correctly, this statement was false. Are you saying that? Uh, the Secretary of State has lied before hearing her because that's what I'm hearing you say and I'd, I'd like a copy of your statement because I want to get a clarification if that's what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts will yield Generally to me yield. to respond. The, um, the questions were whether the CIA knew that the for there was a forgery and the information was incorrect about uh, the claim that they were trying to get uranium from Niger. The CIA advised, according to the CIA, the National Security Agency and Dr. Rice about this. She claims that they did not advise her about it, but we've heard on, uh, from uh, the former head of the uh, CIA that he did no talk to Dr. Rice. We've also heard that Dr. Hadley, who was her top assistant received the information from the CIA. He acknowledges that he received the information from the CIA. It's hard for me to understand how she could claim she never knew about it. Her claim was maybe people in the bowels of the CIA knew about this, but I was never told. So I would like to know well, why she wasn't told. Well, but, you, but, but my, my, my I question hear from her to you about is, it. are you saying that she lied? before hearing her testify because you said her statement was I'll reclaim false. my time. I, I don't think it's necessary to start characterizing. I think it's explained so even everybody could understand on that, and I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Would you yield again to me uh, since I'll you still have again. a green light? I didn't say that she lied. I said she appeared on multiple national news shows where she claimed that the intelligence community did not know at that time or at levels that got to us that there, that there were serious questions about that report, end quote. I said this statement was false. This statement was factually false. I didn't say she lied, but I think this is a false statement. And I think uh, uh, we ought to hear from her directly. This is on a very important event in the history of this country. And she was in the key position, and I think it's uh, only fair to her and to all of us and the American people and to history to hear from her directly and to be able to ask her some questions about it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, gentleman yields back his time. Uh, uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, thank you. This is the um, one subpoena that I, I did want to speak on, and I appreciate the indulgence of the committee. Two-thirds of the House of Representatives voted to give the President the authority to go into Iraq and three-quarters of the Senate. And obviously, this was a decision that each of us made uh, from our hearts, we, we didn't try to convince other people to make a decision like this because you have to live with it, my God, the rest of your life. I met with the French, the Brits, the Turks, the Jordanians, and the Israelis. They all thought Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. They all thought, except for the French, that he would use it. 
the Israelis, um, coincidentally, uh, had an investigation of how they could be so wrong. Uh, you could add it to the pile that, that uh, the, ch uh, the ranking member um, has held up. And they concluded they were wrong. They didn't conclude they lied. They didn't c conclude anything other than they were damn wrong. Now, you know, I remember George Romney years ago saying when he supported the war in Vietnam uh, that he was brainwashed by, by the generals. Sometimes I think we, we want to blame everybody else for the decisions we made. Each one of us made this decision. It wasn't Condoleezza Rice's fault. It even wasn't the Secretary of Defense, uh, our Secretary of State. We all made a conclusion, and we all have to live with it. And I think now what's, what's happening is we want to blame somebody else for a decision we made. I don't blame anyone else. I made that decision. I could even say I was impacted by a president. And he didn't happen to be George W. Bush. He happened to be President Bill Clinton. I suspect in the, some part of my mind that maybe Hillary Clinton was more impacted by, by another president other than George W. Bush. What you will succeed in getting here here is either to have her say the same thing or say, you know what, I made a mistake. Uh, maybe I misled. Then what? Then are you going to ask to impeach her? Is that going to help us win the war in Iraq or help us get our troops home? What will be accomplished by this, other than some real satisfaction? I've seen that satisfaction from my own side of the aisle. I, I saw how we tried to get rid of a president through impeachment. I voted against impeachment for one reason alone. I knew it would just be somebody else's term later. So now you have the majority. Now you can do what you saw some Republicans do. You can get that satisfaction. But then I, I know what's going to happen. The same thing will happen to you that happened to us. The American people say, I'm fed up with it. And they're going to vote you out of office just like they voted us out of office. I'd be happy to yield Thank to you. Mr. Davis. Let me just, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, let me just note that these questions have been asked and answered under oath. In her confirmation hearing, under oath, she says, I don't recall intelligence community concerns about the credibility of reports about Iraq's attempts to obtain uranium from Africa either at the time of the Cincinnati speech or the State of the Union. She said, I did discuss with Stephen Hadley concerns the intelligence community had about protecting sources and methods regarding reports on Iraqi attempts to procure uranium from Africa. These concerns were addressed by citing a foreign government service. I don't recall any discussion of concerns about the credibility of the reports. I don't recall discussing intelligence community doubts with Director Tenet prior to the State of the Union. And I don't recall reading or receiving the CIA memo of October 2002. However, I was aware of the October 2002 National Intelligence Estimate stating Iraq also began vigorously trying to procure uranium ore in yellow cake, acquiring either could shorten the time Baghdad needs to produce nuclear weapons. These were under oath before a Senate committee, asked and answered. It just seems to me, to, if, a, if she couldn't recall it in 2005, I don't think she's going to recall it today. These have been asked and answered and overreported. Uh, and independent groups have looked at this as well and supported it. This is just nothing more but an attempt to get the Secretary of State to come in here and uh, take, take time from her schedule and rehash this whole thing and make political headlines. And it's not what we ought to be doing. Gentleman's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? General Lately from, uh, California. from uh, California. Can we get to the vote? Um, because I would like to hear directly from the Secretary of State. You can read all of that, but I voted against this war, and I want to hear from her why she gave us out misinformation. So can we move the question? Does General Lady yield to me? Oh, keep me going. You got it. Thank keep you. Going. It just seems to me that this administration has a lot of people that don't recall things. Mm -hmm. She didn't recall this. She didn't recall that. We heard that from Loretta Doan. We had five witnesses that heard her say at the end of their political presentation, what can we do to help our Republican candidates? We heard it from the Attorney General. He didn't recall, he didn't recall, he didn't recall. I guess that's the all-purpose thing to say when you're under oath. But I want to know, what did she know about this? I voted for this war, Mr. Shays, based on some old-fashioned deference that the President of the United States has more information than I do, and that he said that Saddam Hussein was, uh, that he was going to have a nuclear weapon. In fact, 
The statement they used over and over again is we don't want a smoking gun to be a nuclear cloud. They scared all the American people and many of us into thinking that they knew what they were talking about. And yet the CIA knew this was all nonsense. And she was informed about it as best I can tell. And how she as the chief person in charge of intelligence for the President of the United States couldn't recall? If that's her answer, then let her say it. I'm not asking for anything extraordinary. I'm only asking for a hearing. I reclaim my time. I, and so I'd like us to proceed to the vote and, and ask her to come in and we'll adjust the date. I'm trying to be reasonable. Thank you. From someone who was smart enough not to vote and not to believe what they were saying, I call for the vote. Well, Mr. you and Mr. And Mr. Chairman, Shays were both smarter Mr. than Mr. anybody Mr. else. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, the further, uh, oh, the, Mr. The, the, the previous question has been requested. Mr. Chairman, we no, agreed no. to roll the votes until uh, uh, earlier, until members had a chance to We, we certainly will roll the vote. Uh, I expect that there'll be a roll call vote request. But this. this meeting was supposed to be over at 12 noon, and we have other obligations. Well, well, I call for the vote. Uh, we get each the get members the here. There was no memo that said it had to be over at noon. Get the member. It said in the schedule from 10 to 12, get the members here so the rest schedule. of us can fulfill our responsibilities. I call for the vote. So now we're stifling debate. Well, I, I would, I would debate. ask the gentlelady okay. uh, to allow uh, two members that have sought recognition to have their say, and then let's see if we can then proceed to the vote. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. for observing Eisen. regular order and move to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, it's been announced today that the Secretary of State will be meeting with her counterpart from Syria. She has been meeting with NATO. She has been meeting traveling on the issues that the gentlelady from California cares about, as I do, this, the inappropriateness of hauling the Secretary of State, not the former National Security Advisor, the Secretary of State, out of the performance of her job is what we're objecting to. The crossing of the line is not who she used to be, but who she is today, particularly considering that she did answer exactly these questions that people say they want to pose to her, she answered those during her confirmation. And she certainly could answer them through interrogatories, having all of the same requirement the to answer yield. our questions. We've I'm asked her to, to answer in writing from herself, and she refuses to even give us an answer to questions that we propounded to her. Certainly, We're trying to be reasonable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and if, in fact, the subpoena was for her to produce uh, herself or answer by interrogatory, we could be having that discussion. We're not getting that discussion. The requirement is that we pull the Secretary of State out of her mission for days, preparatory and the actual days here, that we allow every member of this committee and perhaps the four other primary committees of jurisdiction that could also have her to each and every one of them ask for her time. With all due respect, America is more important than to have the Secretary of State out over something that in fact is done. There is no immediate danger to America as a result of what may have been put in a President's State of the Union speech four years ago, and I would yield to the ranking member. Uh, please yield. Oh, uh, let, me, let me just say, if this, if the, I agree with Mr. Rice. If this were a question of having her answer interrogatories, we would be having a different discussion and probably be supportive, but that's not what the motion is. And uh, you, you, we I would further yield, yield to uh, the gentleman from uh, Indiana. I thank the gentleman. I have. Uh, Two points. One, uh, briefly on the uh, subpoena request that Dr. Rice also refers to the needle exchange where uh, the, the assertion is, is that Mr. Waxman and, and Mr. Cummings had written to Secretary Rice and had not received a response where, in fact, they did receive a response. They didn't like the response as the uh, author rep of repeated amendments on the uh, ban for what I believe is a, a heroin support program. Uh, that passed overwhelmingly with Democratic support, it would be illegal for the administration to change their policy when Congress has, in fact, mandated otherwise. But I also wanted to comment on, on what I believe is a gross misrepresentation. And quite frankly, uh, I, I respect the chairman deeply, even though we have, have different um, views on many things, but I believe this is a bit over the top. We know for a fact, and in my last briefing before I uh, struggled and voted uh, for, to support the war. Ironically, at that briefing, I believe I was the only Republican there. There may have been one other. They were all Democratic colleagues. 
and Condoleezza Rice was one of the two briefers, we ask, as we always do in intelligence briefings, how sure they were of different things. We went through that they had multiple sources, the credibility, the stove piping, 20% this, 30% that, 70% this, 60% that. Why? Well, we're getting it from different agencies. We didn't realize that some of the sources were the same source. But give me a break. Members of Congress know full well nothing is 100%. To act like you were deceived that we had too much stovepiping, but we all knew nothing was 100%. We all know nothing is ever 100% in intelligence. And trying to get blood out of a turnip and get a different answer on these questions of what got in a speech is ridiculous. We know that, that we had errors in the intelligence reports, and so something was 40% 40, 40 instead of 70%, which 20% instead of 30%. Some of us wouldn't have made a different decision, but I resent the inference here that anything is ever 100%, and any member of Congress who's ever been to a briefing knows that full well. Yield back. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, members, we will now proceed to a vote on this subpoena and all of the other pending uh, motions before us. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes. I have a unanimous consent request. The gentleman will state his unanimous consent request. Um, given, uh, 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 given that the chairman ruled that all amendments aren't germane if they don't apply to exactly the same uh, person uh, named in the resolution subpoena, and given that the chairman has already ruled uh, in a rather tortured uh, interpretation of the committee rules that new subpoenas can, in fact, be added the day of the markup, and given the, the, the only reason given... Just ask you, just give me your unanimous consent request. Let's the, get to the bottom line on this one. Given the uh, only point of order against Mr. Micah's amendment was that it didn't have the RNC, I would like unanimous consent to direct the chairman to issue a subpoena to Samuel Berger seeking his testimony, which I believe is a, a relevant matter and would like the committee to be able to have a, 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 a direct vote on it. Uh, if, since you ruled out of order, uh, object. being part of another subpoena. Objection is heard Objection to the unanimous order. consent request. Now we will proceed to a vote. The uh, who, first who vote. Did we just have who objected, Mr. Chairman? I objected. <laughs> if you want me to find somebody else, I'll find yeah, somebody no, Mr. else. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, we, Chairman, we just wanted unanimous. to hear you loud and clear. That's all. Vote number one is the appeal of the chair's germaneness ruling on the First Amendment by Representative Micah to the uh, first, to chair's first motion for a subpoena. So the, mo the vote now comes on the appeal of the chair's germaneness ruling on, oh, no, so the, 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 the first vote is uh, the chairman's, appeal of the chairman's decision. Uh, do members re insist on a recorded vote? We would prefer a record, a, a vote on our amendments. Well, we can do a vote. Can we do a voice vote on this? Can we do, uh, may we do a voice vote? Do a voice. Okay, all those in favor of the appeal of the chairman's germaneness ruling say aye. Yes. That's correct. Chair recommends a no on this, Eric. I want correct. members to vote their consciences. <laughs> I won't take it personally, but I will then ask for a roll call so I can see who <laughs> voted against me if I lose. <laughs> All those in favor of uh, overturning the chair's germaneness ruling say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The no's appear to have it. The no's have it, and the motion's not agreed to. The vote now comes on the appeal of the chair's germaneness ruling on the Second Amendment of the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, to the chair's first motion. Uh, if, uh, without objection, we'll proceed to a voice vote. Those who uh, agree with the appeal of the, who want to overturn the chair's germaneness ruling, say aye. Are those opposed say no. The no's appear to have it. The motion's not agreed to. Uh, vote now comes on the first subpoena uh, requested by the chairman to the RNC chair for testimony and documents. You want a roll call? Okay, uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Waxman? Vote uh, aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Towns? Give me an aye. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Ms. Maloney? Aye. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. 
Mr. Cumming votes aye. Mr. Kersenich? Aye. Mr. Kersenich votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Ms. Watson? Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Mr. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Yarmuth? Mr. Yarmuth votes aye. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley votes aye. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Ms. McCollum? Mr. Cooper? Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen? Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Mr. Hodes? Aye. Mr. Hodes votes aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Ver Murphy votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes? Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch? Aye. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. David votes no. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Shays? Aye. Mr. Shade votes no. Mr. McHugh? Aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Platts? Mr. Cannon? Mr. Cannon votes no. Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Issa? Mr. Issa votes no. Mr. Marchant? Mr. Marchant votes no. Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? Ms. Fox? Ms. Fox votes no. Mr. Bray Bilbray? Mr. Solly? Any other member wish to uh, vote? If not, the uh, clerks will report the vote. We have 20 A's, 8 no's. 20 A's, 8 no's. The, uh, the uh, subpoena is agreed to. The motion is agreed to. Now we come to the second um, proposed subpoena, and the first item on that is an amendment to the chair's proposal by a gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, uh, to limit the RNC search through search terms. Mr. Issa, do you want a recorded vote or a voice vote? Mr. Chairman, I believe that it was well within the purview and should have been ruled germane, so on this I would ask for a recorded vote. Okay. Those who, uh, well, no, no, it was ruled germane. We debated it and uh, it's, it's just on the amendment itself. Your amendment was germane. Do you want to roll call on your amendment? Am I? Yes. Oh, no. No, we didn't. This is on your amendment. You want? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll do a voice. Okay. All those in favor of the uh, ISA amendment to uh, limit the uh, scope of the uh, motion will say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 It appears that the no's appear to have it. The no's have it, and the amendment's not agreed to. There, that, that brings us to the second uh, proposed subpoena request offered by the chairman to the Republican National Committee. Uh, uh, how do we members wish to proceed? Do you want a roll call vote on that or a voice vote? We can voice this and go to a roll call on the last one. Okay. All those in favor of the um, uh, motion uh, uh, second sub to support the second subpoena to the RNC uh, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the motion is agreed to. The last vote is on the motion uh, by the chairman uh, with regard to Secretary of State Rice. And let's uh, uh, call the roll. Mr. Waxman. Aye. Mr. Lantos. Mr. Towns. Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski. Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Ms. Maloney. Ms. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Aye. Mr. Cummings votes aye. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Davis, Illinois? Aye. Mr. Davis votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Clay? Aye. Ms. Watson? Aye. Ms. Watson votes aye. Mr. Lynch? Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Mr. Higgins? Aye. Mr. Higgins votes aye. Mr. Yarmuth? Mr. Yarmuth votes aye. Mr. Braley? Mr. Braley votes aye. Ms. Norton? Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Ms. McCollum? Aye. Ms. McCollum votes aye. Mr. Cooper? Aye. Mr. Cooper votes aye. Mr. Van Hollen? Aye. Mr. Van Hollen votes aye. Mr. Hodes? Aye. 
Mr. Hode votes aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Murphy votes aye. Mr. Sarbanes? Aye. Mr. Sarbanes votes aye. Mr. Welch? Aye. Mr. Welch votes aye. Mr. Davis, Virginia? Yeah. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Shays? No. Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. McHugh? No. Mr. Micah? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Platts? Mr. Cannon? No. Mr. Cannon votes no. Mr. Duncan? Mr. Turner? Mr. Isa? No. Mr. Isa votes no. Mr. Marchant? Mr. Mar Marchant votes no. Mr. Westmoreland? Mr. McHenry? No. Mr. McHenry votes no. Mrs. Fox? No. Ms. Fox votes no. Mr. Bilbray? Mr. Solly? No. Mr. Solly votes no. Any other me member wish to respond to the roll? If not, the clerks will tally the vote. Yeah. 21 ayes, 10 noes. 21 ayes, 10 noes. The uh, motion is agreed to. That concludes our business for today, and we stand adjourned. Thanks. Thank all the members for coming. On this morning's Washington Journal, Weekly Standard editor Bill Crystal on U.S. policy in Iraq, then Kirk Johnson of USAID on reconstruction efforts in Iraq, later Princeton University professor Walter